I can't wait until one day where uh, one of our sponsors is our fish flops. I will talk about them forever. I have refused. That will be my one veto. <laughs> Every time I wear them, someone goes, everyone's like, I love your shoes. And I go, holy mackerel, you noticed? <laughs> oh, um, you hurt me physically. <laughs> Should we start? I suppose. Okay. We can't end first, you know. <laughs> what if we just ended instead of starting? <laughs> There's like, bye. <laughs> okay. What if we just didn't say anything and just started talking? Like, I don't know. I feel like we always say hello and it becomes a whole thing. Why don't we just skip the pleasantries? Just like, how do we say hello backwards? Ole. <laughs> That's got to be something in Swedish, right? Like, I don't know what you're saying, but it might be offensive. <laughs> I mean, isn't that, isn't that how you spell hello backwards? Ole. Yes. I mean, we did spend a long time trying to figure out how to spell Megan backwards, and that didn't go so well. So uh, I still am not sure how to spell Megan because there's so many damn ways to spell it. Okay. That's true. There's no proper way. Uh, I did just get a message from a Scorpio Megan, and that episode hasn't even been released yet. I'm sorry, a message from a Scorpio Megan. I'm like, Megan, just wait till this this next episode. You're going to love it. Do you know how many Scorpio <laughs> Megans tweet me? And I'm like, I don't know how much interaction I should allow. <laughs> Anyway, hello everyone. This is episode 180, which means we are only 20 away from 200. The big two double O. That's what I say. We That's keep what saying like we got to gotta, we gotta figure something out, like uh, party wise, and I have yet to do that. Uh, have I know you? we got to actually map it out and make sure we know the date because one day we'll just sit down and go, oh shoot, it's episode 200 and not have anything planned. I feel like episode 200 is going to be the day where we both fly to each other's cities by yes. accident and Eva's having an aneurysm. And Eva just quit. <laughs> Eva, finally, Eva finally quit. We did it. We did it. We drove her to the brink. It, it's like, um, again, the office episode where they're like, if I, if I get her to depression, I'll at least have done my job. <laughs> <laughs> the stages of grief exactly um i wanted to say real quick i finally got my my little i got a mini setup here um i can tell because my old look was so bland and you get to record in the studio now and and now i have i em gave me these lemon lights um for my birthday yes i did and uh, i have Do a little twinkle? here have you have you set them up you know they're too short to reach a plug mm. so i gotta find an extension cord and really get it you know, pretty wild. And that makes, that will take me some time. My, you know, my Skillshare course hasn't fully ended yet. My, my final exams the haven't final, happened. The final chapter is buy batteries for your fucking lemon lights. <laughs> I'm pretty sure there's probably an entire <laughs> chapter, like, please don't buy lemon lights or put them up anywhere in your house. But if you're, if you're thinking about bringing in lemon print, <laughs> you've done it wrong. <laughs> I have way too much lemon print in my house. I love it. Um, also, oh, I have my wine. Look, I have a little table for my wine. Look at you. I'm I love prepared. It. I even opened it already. 19 crimes. Um, Who's our prisoner of du jour? This guy, he he's actually really handsome. Um, huh. I don't know his name, but the crime is grand larceny, theft above the value of one shilling. So oh. you and I at the Cheesecake Factory have already broken that rule. Absolutely. At least by 10 shillings. At least by 10 what cheesecakes. Your, 10 cheesecake. How many shillings is a cheesecake? Um, how are you? What are you drinking? Why are you drinking? Do we do that anymore? We should. We should. We've we got, should. We've got 20 episodes to really bring it back. And then on the 200th. Yeah, we got to really like get to our roots. So let's see. Why am I drinking? Hmm. Uh, I don't know. I've been in a little, in a weird headspace lately. Just, uh, I guess I'm, it's not that I'm drinking in a negative way or a positive way, just kind of in like a bleh way. Oh, no. Um, I mean, I get that, though. We're in the middle of this pandemic. I think it's finally catching up with me because, like, I spent the last, like, 120 days being like, this is great. And then and now I'm like, oh, boy. Like I, uh, You and I were both so <laughs> confident in the beginning because you were like, oh, it's fine. I like to be home. And I was like, I'm an introvert. I like to be home. And now we're like, uh-oh. I think it's – I honestly think it's that, like, now there's the – um I'm, I'm being seduced by some of the things that are opening up and because they're open, part it's of my, hard. part of my brain is saying like, oh, well I can go do that. But like, I, yes, I have it, like the world was making the choice for me to stay home when everything shut down. And now it's like it's up to right. me and, and I don't have a, everyone, and everyone I don't have a lot of discipline. Home. I'm going to stay inside. I'm just getting sad because I realize not everyone is inside. It's hard because I mean, I'm in Ohio and everything is like, they were like way ahead of the curve with the whole, I mean, obviously now 
uh, it's a different story, but they were way ahead. So cases were super low and they reopened and now everyone's like at bars and literally on my yeah. street, there's like two bars and I like have to walk past with my mask while I'm walking Geo and I'm like, I can't have a beer there. Yeah. I mean, this is ultimate first world problems, but you're right. Like it is a different vibe now because some people are going out and um, yeah. it just feels weird. Like we have to kind of I think follow our own set of rules. Yeah. I think it's uh as you might say after our last conversation with Skillshare, the final test, um, because uh, I feel like, uh, again, I thought the world, you know, the world was deciding for me, but I went camping with Allison last minute a while ago, and obviously we were in the middle of the woods and secluded and we're not near anybody for a very long distance. But um, as we were driving, we just saw people walking through the, like doing their own thing on like normal busy streets. And I was like, one idiots two i wish i was them. i'm so jealous of those <laughs> idiots i know it's hard it is i mean the only time i leave my house is to go to the doctor which is not as exciting um as it i sounds. imagine not <laughs> but uh but yeah oh i also i guess for um a good thing a good reason why i drank is because last week uh actually the same day we came back from camping i think or maybe it was the night before we watched the hamilton uh movie oh we watched that too yeah it was really good i i did my thing because i knew i would want to talk through it and i also knew i would want to like sing through it and i was like i'm not gonna <laughs> do that to allison because she's never seen hamilton so i had like a nice five minute uh a prelude where I was like, these are Aww. all of my thoughts. I will nudge you when they happen. I will not speak. <laughs> oh, that's very thoughtful of you. Thank Blaise you. And I had never seen it. And like, I don't think we talked about this, but one of the, the big gift that I got you for your birthday was supposed oh, yeah. to be four tickets to Hamilton in LA at the Pantages. And it was supposed to be you, Allison, me and Blaze. I bought four tickets. And then obviously that didn't happen. And StubHub finally refunded me because that was not it. <laughs> they were like, oh, we'll give you a coupon. I was like, <laughs> For Hamilton ticket prices? No, no. I want my money back. So they were very good about that, thankfully. But um, yeah, so I felt really like sad because I was watching it and I was like, Em and I were going to see this I know. live with our friend Lynn, who doesn't really want to associate with us. Our, our real but, goal, you bought those four tickets so that we could get backstage and tell them our, our Houdini idea. I bought them that week, actually. Um <laughs> I actually bought them thinking I was afraid that when our friend anniversary came along, I was afraid that you would like do something crazy. So I like bought them just in case I bought them as a birthday gift. And then I was like, that's fair. Just, I'll buy them now just in case something happens. But then you like shit all over Kremit and it just was, you know, I was like, you don't deserve these tickets. <laughs> Listen, honestly, we should just get four tickets for Kremit because they deserve it for sure. Um, <laughs> no, we had a, we had a great, uh, a great birthday, by the way. We, we really did not talk much about the things we did because it definitely got upstaged with your massive gift of appearing like of Houdini. Appearing, right. Um, like Houdini. And also all the nonsense that the rest of the world was doing in June. We were like, let's just let them have this for a minute and, uh, let uh, the conversation revolve not around us for a hot second. Exactly. So yeah, that's, but we had a good time. So do you, do you have a reason why you drink? I should ask real quick. Um, well, you know how I have AC it's busted up in the third floor where I'm <gasps> sitting. So I'm hot oh, as no. hell and I'm oh. back in humid country. So my, my native deodorant is working overtime. And I know I just mentioned two sponsors in like the span <laughs> of 10 minutes, but it's like the real deal. I've had to carry my native deodorant in my purse, like a giant weirdo. Oh no. Um, Anyway, but uh, other than that, I'm like, I feel like our house are, oh, the painters painted everything. It's What's it look like? So nice. I'm so happy with it. I'll have to like do a little Instagram live tour or something, um, but I'm very happy with it. And also I'm happy there's no more strangers in my house every day. But the AC would be nice. Yes, I see. The AC would be nice. So let's hope that kicks in by next recording session. Look, just find yourself a box, fly out here. You can have my AC. It's fine. Oh, okay. I'll find myself a box. Also, real quick before we get started, I just want to put out there really quick that I'm so excited for my story today. So if you're listening to this part, just just don't leave before I start my story because it's a doozy. Um, I think everybody can probably agree right now that things are a little tougher than they usually are. Um, and if there is something interfering with your happiness or preventing you from achieving your goals, um, you can turn to BetterHelp. BetterHelp will assess your needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist. And you can start communicating in under 48 hours. 
Um, it's not a crisis line. Uh, it's not self-help. It is professional counseling done securely online. And there is a broad range of um, expertise available, which may not be locally available in many areas. So it's got a whole lot of options that you may not have otherwise. You can log into your account anytime and send a message to your counselor and you'll get timely and thoughtful responses. Plus, you can schedule weekly video or phone sessions so you won't ever have to sit in an uncomfortable waiting room as with traditional therapy, especially right now. Mm. Like it's so it's such a godsend to have um, online therapy right now because I mean, obviously, it's extremely scary to go anywhere. A lot of places are closed. And um, with the, you know, increased stress and uh, anxiety that this world is coming to uh, (laughs) finding and finding help online is, I think, the way to go. BetterHelp is committed to facilitating great therapeutic matches so they make it easy and free to change counselors if needed, and it's more affordable than traditional offline counseling and financial aid is available. So again, very useful and a lot of other options that you might not have otherwise. BetterHelp wants you to start living a happier life today. And by the way, so do I'm and Christine. We want you to live a happier life. Be healthy mentally. (laughs) Visit their website and read their testimonials that are posted daily. Visit betterhelp.com slash drink, that's better H-E-L-P, and join over 1 million people taking charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional. In fact, so many people have been using BetterHelp that they are recruiting additional counselors in all 50 states. Wow. Um, there is a special offer for, and that's why we drink listeners, to get 10% off your first month at betterhelp.com slash drink. Drink. Christine. Yes. Uh, guess what? Sometimes I think you're a little bit fab. Sometimes I think you're a little bit fit, and sometimes I think you're extra fun. And sometimes I'm all three at the same time. <laughs> well, that is because, well, it's not because I'm FabFitFun naturally, but it also means that I am obsessed with the FabFitFun box that we get seasonally. Um, I know M. Allison gets a box as well at oh, your yes. household. You mean the the one package that I cannot rip from her cold, dead hands? Yes. Yes, that's exactly it. <laughs> exactly. And, you know, I'll bring it up again. I recently moved and the week I got here, my FabFitFun box arrived and I opened it and suddenly I had all this cute decor for my house. I had like a little vase and like a little diffuser. And so when people came over, they were like, wow, you're already so, your house is already so fab fit and fun. They should really just call it gift from heaven. So (laughs) fab fit fun is a woman's lifestyle subscription box filled with full size premium beauty, lifestyle, fitness, home and wellness products sent straight to your doorstep each season. And every box is curated specifically to each individual person because you choose what goes in your box each season. The FabFitFun box is the perfect way to treat yourself or others if you so choose and get yourself ready for the new season ahead with their carefully curated box of products. You'll never be disappointed with what you receive because you're only receiving the products you want when you customize your box online, which is also one of my favorite parts of the year. Uh, You save money on quality full-size products because these deals do not last long, so get yourself over there. Uh, I mean, let's be clear. It really is like the one package that Allison will open immediately. She loves leaving packages at the front of the door and not opening them and waiting forever to open them. But when it's FabFitFun, it's the first <laughs> thing that she rips open and it's every single thing in there. She It's better than the last thing she pulled out. It's like Christmas morning. So sign up today to receive your first box and join a community of over 1 million people who are already obsessed, including me. Use coupon code DRINK for $10 off your first box at FabFitFun.com. It retails for $49.99, but it always has a value of over $200. So that's $10 off when you use code DRINK at FabFitFun.com. I'm pretty excited about mine. I'm nervous and that a lot of it is me reading direct quotes, but also you will see that these are quotes that I could not paraphrase. Everyone needed to be involved. I like when you read quotes. It makes it feel so like you're telling me a story. I like it when I read quotes because I have to do less research. Um, But (laughs) exactly. Just copy paste. um, I will say this story is like kind of fucking bananas. It's kind of like, I don't know. I don't know how to describe it. I don't know why I never heard of it before. I found most of this information, I would say 99% of this information came from one article on Mysterious Universe. Um, I love that website. I do too. It's, and again, I don't know where I, why I hadn't heard of this story before, but it's pretty much like, it's apparently real, but it sounds like Twilight fan fiction. Oh my, okay. Wait, Twilight or Twilight Zone? No, no. <laughs> Twilight, Twilight. Uh-oh. Like it sounds like a Stephanie Meyer book. Oh, I was really hoping it was Twilight Zone, but I guess we're gonna go the other direction. It's, All right, it's not I'm about in. vampires, but like it's like if instead of 
Edward being a vampire, he were an alien. That's it's like what's that? Whatever the supernatural version of Twilight is. Is this the an UFO alien version. love story? Oh my gosh, the, I'm excited. The UFO light. Okay, so um, this is the story of Elizabeth Clarer. Okay, okay. Clarar, Clarer, Clarer. Okay, so Claru. <laughs> No. K no. <laughs> K L A R E R. Silence. <laughs> okay. Um so Elizabeth Clarer, this is a story in uh South Africa. Um Elizabeth was born in 1910 and she up until the story was like a very respected person in her community. Um she studied music and studied meteorology at Cambridge and Trinity College. She was a pilot for the Royal Air Force, and she worked with the South African Air Force Intelligence to decode secret transmissions during World War II. Ooh. So, like, has, like, a legitimate, valid background of, like, having a good head on her shoulders. Right. <clears throat> and then 1950 hits. <laughs> and then uh, uh, oh. um, Elizabeth reads a book on UFOs, and all of a sudden, all of these repressed memories from her childhood comes back. Oh, shit. And so it started when she was seven years old and apparently her and her sister, uh, saw a, a lit up silver disc in the sky and it flew over their farm. And she also happened to see a bright orange crater fly by at the same time. And she soon after this story, after like that memory from when she was seven came many more, uh, sightings of the same disc started flying by her over the years. And I guess her memory started flooding back of this <laughs> one UFO she kept seeing over her farm. Okay. Um, so most locals say that this UFO was a, a lightning bird with that was in their lore. It sounds like it may be like a thunderbird. I don't, I might be confusing the, the cultures that it's, it's their version of a mythical lightning bird. So I guess a lightning Got bird, and a thunderbird are different things, but um, and this is in South Africa, right? You said. Right, right. Okay. Yeah. So they're different things. Um, oh, but, I don't know. I'm just. Uh, well, I think Thunderbird is like an indigenous thing. I see. Like in the U.S. In the U.S. Yeah. Uh, obviously, I don't remember my own fucking research. So please, if you know, let me know. But <laughs> most most locals swear that it was like some uh, cryptid or a mythological creature. Um, but Elizabeth said, no, it's a UFO. Um, she said that she saw a lightning flash, which would explain why other people saw a lightning bird or something like that. I just love that. It's kind of like, oh, that's ridiculous. That's not a UFO. That's a mythical creature. Yeah, exactly. Flying past. And then she's like, it's not a mythical creature. It's a UFO. Like no matter what, it's ridiculous. And yeah, like, one of them, either one is, is, uh, it's, is pretty wild tough to me. to swallow. Some might say. Yeah. Um, by the way, your makeup is looking delightful today. Let's just, what? let's just, Me? let's just oh. mention it. Let's just, let's just see what happens when I say it and put it in the world. What happens there? Well, I appreciate that very much because last episode we were all zoomed in my face and I didn't realize I had like lipstick on my face last time. And I was like, oh no, I looked so ridiculous. So I've, I tried to a distance myself from the camera, which I should have done from the start. Good choice. And, uh, B, I was, I bought setting spray. I don't know if it works, Ooh. but well, I maybe that's what's happening. My, Maybe it's not leaking all over my face anymore in the humidity. Are you wearing your fuck Trump lipstick? Mm. I think I'm wearing um, notorious RGB, RBG. Yeah, I think I'm wearing RGB today, but maybe fuck Trump. I always like to say I'm wearing that one because it's more fun. Um, well, you look delightful. Um, well, I appreciate that. You, you what, from what I can see of you on your throne, you also look delightful. You got to say that because what I'm else not a is new? <laughs> I know. I'm your uh, peasant. <laughs> so, uh, okay. So she, Elizabeth sees this lightning flash and sees a UFO humming, uh, like making kind of that like mechanical sound. Um, and inside of it. So she says that there's like, it looks like a kind of a classic UFO where there's a dome in the middle and there's portholes, um, that you can either look into or look out of. And inside of the portholes, she sees a, a humanoid creature, looking back at her. <gasps> oh my. This is a quote from Elizabeth. Oh, he was very handsome. 
Em, that literally sounds like the conversation we just had with one another. You realize that, I, right? I said you looked really beautiful and I was like, wait a minute. It's I feel like I knew what was coming and it just came out of I'm me. I'm like in an alien porthole just see, looking <laughs> back at you. I really should have been like, you look like an alien, right? Yeah, hanging yeah, out. yeah. Uh, it's a compliment. She said, oh, he was very handsome, tall with an angular face and hair that was graying at the temples. So he's a silver fox, apparently. Oh, he is, huh? A little salt and pepper. And she's a child. Oh, 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 right. I Which, did like, kind of Which, like, is quickly, um, quickly not paid attention to throughout this because she, so she's a child and then, uh, spoiler alert, she ends up, like, seeing this UFO throughout her entire life. So I don't know what the age is during each part of this story, but like it's sure. happening through like her being like 50. So, Oh wow. I'm gonna, okay. I'm going to assume as the story goes on, so does her age. So, um, so she, apparently she saw this very handsome alien and uh -huh. <laughs> then all of a sudden she felt this incredible heat pouring off of the machine, almost like it was, I guess like any, like when you're near a heavy machine, you feel the heat sure. generator off of it. Like the exhaust. Exactly. And she began having these, uh, she started feeling really close to this alien and she started. Oh boy. She felt like she had this telepathic communication with it. Uh, she later found out that this creature's name was Akon. <laughs> Stop. Okay, hold Nobody on. Nobody want to see us together. Oh, <laughs> my God. Wait, I never knew what that song was written about. It makes so much sense now. Because I got you. Isn't that Akon? No, I don't think so. Who's, the, who's Akon? It? Oh, Akon's the lonely one, right? Lonely. Who? No, Akon sings the song about uh, butts. Well, that's a lot of people, I guess. Okay, um, well, that did not stop. Hang on. Akon, convict. Oh, right. Okay, hang on. What's I'm gonna, that song? I'm looking at up Akon songs. <laughs> this is embarrassing. I No, I okay, I was right. Lonely is one. And then you're right. Don't matter. Oh, wait, because I got you. Wait, am I oh, right wait, maybe both that times? Is, maybe. I'm thinking of Akon from my high school years at like no, homecoming dance. You're right, too. We're all, oh, wow, we're so on top of it. You're thinking when are of, we ever? You're thinking of the song Smack That on all the That's the one. <laughs> all on the floor. I just, that's literally my memory from high school dances where I was like, why are we doing this? Does anybody look, like, look around? <laughs> Do you see what we're doing? We're literally children. This is so weird. Um, well, by the way, I don't want to smack we know. anything. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's interesting. I didn't realize he was an alien um, life force, but I guess it does make a little, <laughs> a little sense now. Um, but we did have a lot of that, uh, whatchamacallit. What's the thing where they change their voices? Oh, the, uh, I don't even remember. Auto-tune. <laughs> Auto-tune. Yeah, very, very between alien. Between Akon and Trey songs, I'm going to have the whole rap community against me. Um, oh, correct. And yes. also, uh, I can't screwed. stop thinking about that song now and how it makes so much sense that it would be about an alien and a human not being allowed to it's, be together. There's literally no possibility that it's about anything else. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> you heard it here first. News flash. <laughs> so Akon uh, was apparently from the planet called Meton. And sure. Meton is in the galactic region of Alpha Centauri. Um, and he was apparently on this UFO particularly. He was a scientist on board. And uh, Elizabeth and him, I guess, had this exchange. And then they ended up becoming friends over time. And so she would regularly go back to that spot hoping to see him. And Ooh. After like 18 months, he finally like showed up again. And I guess this hill literally began being called uh, um, Flying Saucer Hill. I think it's still actually known as that, not outside. Of, okay. Like even outside of the story. Um, Makes sense. And so 18 months later, in 1956, she saw the this craft again in the sky and it came down to the hill. And this is a quote I knew no fear. He had the most compelling hypnotic eyes and I ran straight into his arms and he said to me, this time you're not afraid, are you? <laughs> oh my God. This is literally Stephanie Myers, uh, like a uh, competitor, competent, competing author. This is <laughs> spot on. Mephany Steyer. Um, <laughs> so apparently Akon took her on board this time. And introduced her to one of his crewmates who was the astrophysicist and botanist on board. 
We don't know oh, his fun. We don't know his name. It's probably Jason Derulo. Trace um, <laughs> Jason Derulo. Oh, God. <laughs> Uh, and so she was eventually taken to um, his solar system, which apparently is not too far from here. Um, That's quite a euphemism, though, it sounds like. <laughs> he took me to his solar system. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, basically they brought uh, they brought her up to a different craft, which was a larger cigar-shaped mothership. And apparently oh. this mothership was literally so massive. It was like five miles long. Um, and it had cities in it. It had parks, it had trees, flowers, and lakes. And, oh my God. uh, so I almost called her Stephanie Meyer. Uh, so Elizabeth <laughs> said that these, uh, creatures look just like humans, but quote, taller, better looking, more considerable and gentle, not aggressive and violent. So more okay, like, well, so a peaceful like human, some, not like humans whatsoever. Got it. Okay, <laughs> cool. And uh, apparently they were originally from Venus. Sure. And uh, they had to relocate to Meton eons ago after Venus had become uninhibitable. A lot of this, by the way, is definitely um, from Mysterious Universe if you're reading along in the article. Um, so Venus was originally like super thriving. Like it, it was pretty much as thriving as Earth in its heyday. And, as uh, Earth a long time ago. <laughs> And uh, it, over time, it just became like too um, hostile or I, I don't know, maybe oh, no. climate change or some shit like that. Um, yeah. So I guess they all ended up having to leave. This is an actual quote um, of her explaining this later in an interview. Um, so Elizabeth says, the Venetian scientists, uh, they recognized the sun was a visible star with maximum and minimum periods of sunspot cycles which happens to this day but at certain epochs in time it expands so now the sun is expanding and contracting all the time but it's uh but it has more intensified radiation and this is uh this is what happened to venus and it began getting closer to the sun and it was drying out uh whatever fauna she had remaining and the great civilization from venus uh which we call the mother planet so i guess venus is the mother planet uh, they needed to get away, so they landed on Earth and the moon as way stations and eventually moved to Meton, um, which now was their home planet because it was very similar to what Venus used to be. Um, oh, wow. And so she says that they still visit Mars and Earth, and the Venus people left a section of their civilization on Earth to look after the planet and advance the mentality and consciousness of the indigenous people on the planet. Um, I don't think that's what we ended up doing. I think we, <laughs> I think we forgot our mission. Um, yeah, I think uh, we got a little lost there. You're right. So so she's saying that there are aliens among us. She's saying that not every earthling is from Venus, but some of us are descendants of got original um, Venus creatures. And got it. hopefully we would be able to help the other earthlings here, um, I guess, fix this planet. Or I think they gave them too big of a project. With very little instruction. They really expected a lot from us. <laughs> Um, so Elizabeth then went back to earth and then kept seeing Akon every now and then. Um, but over time realized that she was attracted to him. Well, I mean, over time, I think we realized that pr pretty much right away, but okay. He played her one of his like mixes, one of his singles, and she was just <laughs> in it to win <laughs> my it. Mix, my mix tape. That's so romantic. So um, recently I went over to my mom's with a gigantic box and she was uh -huh. like, what is that? And I was like, it's going to change your life and my <laughs> life forever. <laughs> and what it was, was my drink works machine. And by the way, we finished off four packs of drinks that oh my evening. God. <laughs> I'm not kidding because now Blaze and my stepdad are all about it too. Basically the drink works machine is like a fancy automatic espresso machine where you press a button and the machine does the rest, except it's for premium cocktails instead of coffee. Wait. Life changing. Uh, I mean, it's... Obviously, super convenient. You choose your drink, you insert the pod, and in under 60 seconds, you'll have a perfectly chilled cocktail or mixed drink on demand, all from the comfort of your home. Um, no shopping or messy cleanup. And truly, I mean, you can start your morning, you know, with some nice coffee. And then by, I don't know, mid-afternoon, maybe mid-morning, who cares? You just kind of whip <laughs> out the drink works, and all of a sudden, you're having a party all day. 
It's true. They have flavors for everyone's taste. So they have tropical cocktails to classic mixed drinks. And they even have sangria and rose spritzers. Um, I got some old fashioned for Blaze. And they have like this Jack Daniels lemonade situation that's really popular. Um, just le- just so you know, I tried all of them. So don't worry. You did? They're all great. Oh. Oh, yeah. You, the host of And That's Why We Drink tried all of them? Okay. Um, every drink includes only premium spirits and mixers, and they're delivered precisely every time. Um, I know that people have splurged on like $20 cocktails before, but drink sure. works. It's as good for so much less. I mean, it's just a deal. Exactly. And like I said, they have this new flavor called Jack Daniels Lemonade, which combines refreshing lemonade with premium Jack Daniels whiskey. Uh, This is Blaze's new favorite. Um, And he didn't really tell me. I just saw him making them multiple times. And I was like, I guess that's Blaze's now. (laughs) Uh, And for our listeners, they've already taken $100 off the price. And now they're going to even throw in free shipping. Um, It's the best deal that they're offering. And it's for a limited time only. So do not do not wait. The best way to get this amazing drink maker with the automatic savings plus free shipping is by going to drinkworks.com. That's D-R-I-N-K-W-O-R-K-S.com. No need to use a code because the best deal is already included. That's drinkworks.com. And remember to please always enjoy responsibly. Uh, Christine, I don't know about you, but sometimes I feel like I need a summer vacation from cooking. Especially, That's- by the way, no, sorry. Especially, by the way, like, during this quarantine, like everyone has been cooking so much more. I mean, I definitely need a break from it. So when the heat rises, uh, I'm looking for ways to do less. And that's why lately I've been skipping out on meal prep and keeping things easy with daily harvest. It's very amazing because especially here in Cincinnati right now, it's so hot and humid, even at like eight in the morning. And when I do not feel like cooking eggs at eight in the morning, instead, I get out my daily harvest. They have these like smoothies that you can just Mm. whip up right away. They have like uh, plant-based ice cream and things like that for when it's super hot out. Um, what's the one that we like the most, Em? It's like the mint. Um, oh, the mint cacao. Is that what it's Oh, my God. Yes. It's so good. I always forget how to pronounce it, so I'm always embarrassed to say that that's my favorite just in case I'm saying it wrong. But You're it's so it right. delicious, I don't <laughs> even care. Um, right now, Daily Harvest is also helping us beat the heat with their refreshing. I know you've said smoothies before, but they also have scoops, which is their new plant-based ice cream. Um, scoops are free of additives, preservatives, and fillers because they're made with whole, nourishing, organic ingredients like black sesame, um, coconut cream, dragon fruit, and they are just so tasty. They have four amazing flavors, and Daily Harvest in general is a lifesaver. They help you stock your home with clean, delicious food that's built on real fruits and vegetables so you can feel good about what you're eating, and they're farm frozen to lock in peak nutrients and taste. With Daily Harvest, there's tons of options for any time of day. Like we said, smoothies. They have these harvest bowls if you're if you're extra hungry for a little entree, a flatbread. Oh, the flatbreads. Uh, <laughs> the oh flatbreads my gosh. are really good. They're so good. We, I'm not kidding. Everyone in my apartment, we all fight for the flatbreads. They're yeah, you got to so call good. dibs. <laughs> Uh, Eating clean with Daily Harvest is easy and effortless, whether you're having a night at home or need a quick bite on the go, and everything stays fresh in your freezer until you're ready to enjoy it. Keep it simple this summer with Daily Harvest. Go to dailyharvest.com and enter promo code DRINK to get $25 off your first box. That's promo code DRINK for $25 off your first box at dailyharvest.com. Dailyharvest. (laughs) Dailyharvest.com. Oh, my God. So here is a quote. Um... I'm just going to read the hyperlink. Maybe we can put it down here or something. But so this is, uh, again, spoiler alert. She ends up writing a book about this. And I pretty much found like a PDF version of it online. And there's so much good juicy shit. Like this is just a couple excerpts of something really just jaw dropping. So um, it's 200 (laughs) dash countries dash download dot org slash English slash Svetelna. Sure. Uh, okay, we'll put it in like we'll put it in a link I hope somewhere. None of you, if you're driving, please don't try to type that into your browser. Also, what's weird about this link is um, I had to. I realized over time that the best excerpts I had to um, like do like Control F and like find. I searched for the word chin because chin chin like your chin because yeah. apparently that was in every little sex scene. The word chin was somehow involved in all of their sex so scenes. So she had a thing for the chin. Got it. Uh, let me show you. Let me show you. So this is a quote um, after I looked up the word chin. Love it. Uh, beloved one. This is a quote. This is her quoting him qu- talking to her. Oh, my God. By the way, officially ruined the phrase beloved one to me. 
Um, uh, oh, is that a phrase that you use pretty often? It wasn't, and it never will be now. <laughs> <laughs> Beloved one, I shall be with you always, Akon softly replied. I am, oh, I am Okay, actually- hold on. I need to pour my wine. I'm sorry. <laughs> I feel like I this thought is, it could last longer than that. This is my retaliation for when you held my hand on stage and sang me like a poem from a serial killer. Okay, that's a really good point. And then I did it again. Well, it's about to get really fucking uncomfortable. On our friend anniversary. Uncom- it's about to get super duper uncomfortable. Maybe for our next friend anniversary, I'll just send you this letter. <clears throat> please do. In your own handwriting, please. I'd prefer it. In cursive. Uh, yes. Beloved one, I shall be with you always, Akon softly replied. Our destiny is bound together. A telepathic link binds our souls in eternal love. Our lives are entwined as a thread of gold weaves a pattern in the sky. Gently, he put his hand under my chin, tilting my head up and back and looked deep into my eyes. My love, my life, my chosen mate, I will return to possess you. Oh, and so the seed of my love within your delicate body. Okay. (laughs) The mark of my love will remain within your soul forever. Goodbye, Akon. This has quickly become much more problematic than I thought at the start. It's like, is it Twilight or Fifty Shades? I'm confused. It's, oh boy, so it's a lot. Eventually, Akon gives her a ring. Um, not f- I, not necessarily for marriage, but you gives- better give her a damn ring after all that <laughs> nonsense. She deserves it. <clears throat> well. He gives her a ring and apparently it, it will enhance their telepathy. So when they're apart, they can, it's like a long distance lamp. Like you gave me, I, but I a want ring. I that. Oh yeah. Listen. Our long distance lamp, but like put it on your necklace or something. Like yeah. Flava Flav. I'll just put a massive fucking color changing lamp on my chain and just wear it around the <laughs> house waiting for you. And um, you literally have shoes that are, that look like actual fish. So I don't <laughs> think, I don't see why this is so strange I to haven't you, done but it yet because sure. I don't know how to do it is the problem. Okay. Okay, fine. So it gets worse um, because, so she give he gives her this ring and this is the story of the ring and Elizabeth's words, not mine. Although I will be, uh, dramatically reading it for you um so basically akon a a, a real quick paraphrase before i get into it is akon told elizabeth that um she was actually the reincarnate of uh, a being on venus that akon was once in love with before venus fell apart and everyone fled um and apparently she died on venus akon said that sometimes it, like it's lucky that she is now an earthling because sometimes uh, his people will take earth women as partners Ugh. as the offspring uh, will be stronger by having mixed blood. Oh, okay. 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 Um, oh boy. So this happens in 1958. They've known each other well for like four years now. And, uh, <clears throat> <laughs> Allison, you okay over there, bud? <laughs> Allison was Allison was working. I, she was on a conference call while I was like doing my notes, and I I was reading oh, this, God. and I started cackling and had to leave the room because she was giving me nasty looks. I thought you started like whispering the words to her. No, I was just I was nervous laughing because I was so uncomfortable. So, <laughs> point blank period, they have sex. Um. Oh wait, well, what? Okay, wait. So this, is she adult now? Please, she, I pray to God she is. Uh, okay. so this was in 54 and she was born in 1910. So yeah, she was 44. Oh, 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 thank God. Okay. Thank God. Okay. So apparently she has a bath. And when I tell you she has a bath, I'm giving only that quick little blip so I can get to the really uncomfortable part. But the Super. link, the link that I want everyone to like look into, like it's so worth it because she goes on for like a page about like how different baths are there and how the water feels like, oh my silk and shit so like it's okay we have to put that in the show notes yeah, so yeah, people yeah. can click on it. it it's really it's worth the read like i as someone who does not read i could i couldn't stop like like going and going on these paragraphs the second m told me just now to read something i was like alarm bells something's either <laughs> wrong or very right i can't decide it's very wrong and you're about to see why so she takes this bath <laughs> which like went on for three pages sure and then this is uh this is very long. This is like half a page worth of a, a quote, but I had to read it and you have to hear it. So I'm going to get my wine. I'm going to sit back and relax. Story time with eyes, them. So, take a bubble bath. <clears throat> Elizabeth says, after the bath, standing naked before the mirrors, Akon came behind me and put his hands into my hair, tumbling it up against his face and burying his lips into its mass. Listen, it's going to get real fucking XXX in here. 
Um, uh, with, okay, wow. So people get mad that we swear in this show. <laughs> Things are about to get if you so have children much weirder. And they're already terrified of aliens. Like, just keep them away from this entire story, especially this, this trigger section. actually like a brand new uh, a phobia in our listener, like a new fear that people didn't even know they had, uh, that I didn't even know I had. Um, mm-hmm. Also, we do have a lot of like preteen fans or like young. It doesn't children. get wildly erotic, but it gets very wordy with like the okay. romance i'm not gonna we're not talking about body parts we're talking about love christine how dare you i'm sorry i have a hard time differentiating holding me close to him he removed a ring from his little finger little finger and placed it over my middle finger okay so now we know that her middle finger and his little finger are the same size um okay. it was exotic and beautiful made of beaten silver and green enamel with a great stone a great stone of light set in the middle of it it's too large for you, my beloved one, so we will place a half band of silver within it. I want you to wear it as it's always a so you're always a part of me to maintain our telepathic connection and communication for all time. I could feel and sense the magic properties emanating from the ring. Akon put his hand under my chin, tilt, <laughs> tilting my head and <laughs> tilting my head up and back, and he kissed me with a long and lingering kiss on the lips. Uh, picking <laughs> picking me up in his arms he carried me to the silken platform by the curved wall uh and our bodies with luxurious comfort i gave myself to the man from outer space <laughs> Whoa. Oh, the people who have crushes on you em are having the best day of their lives right now <laughs> <laughs> this is the closest to like reading like erotic erotic information you'll ever get out of me um, i really hope so i i really hope so Christine, look, you've had this is a long time coming after you made me listen to you twice with I, that poem. Listen, I, I don't deny it. I don't deny it. My beloved, my life, Akon whispered again and again as I surrendered in ecstasy to the magic of his love making. <laughs> so okay. I'm just not even gonna I'm not even gonna say anything. <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing like the real uncomfortable laugh right now, like the legitimate one that you guys rarely hear because <laughs> we try to avoid extremely uncomfortable things. <laughs> Apparently, we used to, not anymore, I guess. <laughs> oh, God. I'm damn not it. done. Okay. I'm sure you're not. If I were done, I would be so uncomfortable. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'm like crying a little bit. Okay. But it has to be is board this in, integral to the story. You got to listen, everyone. It's, it's not important. integral. I'm just I just need everyone else to know what I had to read. OK. <laughs> our bodies merged in magnetic union as the divine essence of our spirits became one. And uh, and in doing so, I became whole. Gross. Uh, as our bodies became one, the fusion of the electric essence of life was attained and the ensuing magnetic emotion of mind and body and perfect unity of, of okay blah, blah, blah. listen if you're writing like this you had the best night of your life like <laughs> um yeah and also you have a really good thesaurus because a lot of those words just kind of meant the same thing i'm pretty sure i'm pretty sure too basically like it's there i mean obviously we all know what they're doing and then it gets kind of homophobic because then a uh, super <laughs> you thought we were done so uh oh. Akon then says, so they've, they've done it. And now she's in like just a fucking ecstasy apparently. And sure. Akon says the true purpose of mating is not only for the reproduction of offspring, but to retain and satisfy opposite forces of electricity so that these elements may fuse and retain nature's balance between the sexes. Blech. One oh, is yeah, not, no, don't, don't love that. One is not balanced without the other. Okay. No. Akon, I don't agree. Mm-hmm. Um, the purpose of mating is not, Oh, I already read that. Uh, each is necessary and vital to the other, speaking only men and only women. And also, like, you're nothing without the with the opposite sex. Yeah, and also gross. <laughs> like, if you're saying that after you've already done it, it's like, now because of me, you are fulfilled. Yeah. Gross. You are whole. Uh, magnetic Yikes. attraction and mating by natural selection has a beneficial effect on forming the mind of the unborn child. 
Um, and then this is where it gets kind of creepy. Uh, if you if you weren't already just oh, sorry. oh sorry <laughs> this is, sorry this is where it gets creepy, folks. It's so, been really comfortable and happy, easygoing. For why f- do you think I'm telling you guys to please go like click on the link in our show notes and read the rest of this for yourself? Because it's and all bananas. I literally don't know why you're telling me that because I'm never <laughs> going to do it. But thanks. Do it with a tall, with a stiff glass of alcohol. Um, oh yeah. So then says. Uh, my beloved, there is no need for you to say anything. I know everything. I've observed you before. It is a knowledge and an understanding that we share. And now you belong to me. It was well, super. It was only necessary for me to wait until you had grown up. Yeah. Uh, well, that was the nice. I guess that was like the least he could do. To want to be one of us, you must think as we do. I observed you first when you were a child with your sister in the garden of your home adjoining the hill at other times i have watched you growing up flying through the skies of earth looking at me and i watched with the lightning high in the sky wrapped you with its purifying flame to make you mine so basically he's been this alien has been stalking her knew (laughs) that knew that she had like a seven-year-old crush apparently on him and then waited till she was 44 seduced her and then gave her a ring that gives her powers and she's still he says to this a day, predator. she's oh for sure sounds like a predator. And uh, by the way, until she died, she swore that all this happened and never changed her story even a little bit. I mean, it's kind of too 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 late, right? Once you write that down, you're like, what are you gonna do? You may say I made it all up, and then you're probably even weirder. It gets even worse because apparently that amazing night led to a pregnancy, and uh, <gasps> during this, there. So I didn't get to see any of this in full detail maybe it's in that long pdf i didn't finish but apparently during this she was also being harassed by like russian spies who were trying to like kidnap the (laughs) alien baby from her oh so that was a b plot got it (laughs) it's a really subtle b plot like they really just wove it in there you barely even see it the russian spies stealing your baby apparently she only had the baby like in four months or something and uh, the baby's name was Ailing, A Y L I N G. It was a son. Okay, um, I mean, it sounds like it's sick, but I guess, <laughs> I guess that works. And so, I don't know if like it was four months because that's like how aliens have babies. I'm confused. They're gestational period. Yeah, I <laughs> right. don't know either. <laughs> so uh, Elizabeth wanted to stay with her lover and her son, but apparently as she described it, the magnetic vibrations of that planet didn't align with her like earth body. And so it was making her sick to stay up there. Oh no. And so she ended up having to go home and she left her son with Akon. Um, and she, uh, she went back to earth, but every now and then she would come back to the hill and meet up with them through like holograms, which sounds like FaceTime to me. Um, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and she used this as an opportunity to go out into the world and preach about like peaceful societies and love. Um, and she, okay, became, I thought it was going to be, she could have gone another direction, oh, a yeah. lot of directions. And so I'm glad it was at least, she would have been valid in either direction too, by the way. Yeah. 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 Um, she became a celebrity in the UFO community. <clears throat> she was interviewed by a lot of people from MUFON, which is the mutual UFO mm. network, the big, uh, alien organization. And uh, she was also the guest of honor at the International Congress, which is like the big uh, annual uh, UFO convention. Got it. Um, She published a book in 1980 called Beyond the Light Barrier, which is the link that I'm trying that I keep talking about. I think it's just a PDF version of that book. Um, It was called Beyond the Light Barrier. And apparently there's like an alleged rumor that this is the C plot that the government was trying to silence her from actually putting the book out or speaking more on it or uh, silencing her and saying like, admit this is fake. They just like read the advanced copy and were like, I don't feel comfortable with with the weird sex scenes you've written. They also like, they also control F'd like uh, they found chin everywhere and they're like, we got to We got to put an end to this. Um, But so... Apparently she was also in the middle of writing a second book called the gravity file, but she died before it was finished in the 19 in 1994. And, um, but she never contradicted herself, even though there's really no evidence of this happening. There's no proof that she was ever pregnant. There's no one wondering where she went for four months while she was like on Venus or some shit or on Meton having a baby. Um, there's also like the ring that he gave her went missing. So she doesn't have that. Um, 
1983, though, she addressed her entire story to the House of Lords in England, and her paper was read at the United Nations meetings. <laughs> Holy shit. And Wait, I, that paper? Apparently. Can you imagine being the one, like some stodgy, you know, <laughs> old man being like, okay, second up on the agenda, and then having to read, like, my sexual chin story. <laughs> Uh, I, I don't know. I think it was just like her story in general. Maybe she wrote like a shorter version, but the book was already out by then, I think. So it should have. Oh, my goodness. Um, and then in 1984, the British Ministry of Defense looked into her story and did announce that UFOs do exist. Okay. Um, and then also in 1963, so this is a little further in the past, but it happened only like 10 years after she met Akon. She ended up marrying an ex-British intelligence officer named Aubrey Fielding, a major Aubrey Fielding. And he has been asked about her experiences with Akon. And Major Fielding said, quote, my wife's been in love with a spaceman for 20 years. That's all right with me as long as he stays in space where he belongs. Oh, my God. And he, this is, that's Jacob, right? Like in the story, in Twilight. Like there's no <laughs> other explanation in my mind. He uh, Apparently oh when God. he died, his ashes were also scattered on Flying Saucer Hill, which feels a little like cuckoldy to me of like. Yeah. Yeah. So the man that yeah. she really loved, he was, his ashes were scattered on the other man's like meetup spot. Yeah, yeah. So anytime he visited her, he'd have to visit this guy too. Yeah. This bozo. Uh, and then oh there was my. another rumor on some website where it was like maybe Akon like killed him like out of jealousy that, Ooh. I don't know. It was just a rumor, but well, obviously no one knows for sure because it no one's talked to Akon. It was just a rumor that the alien was trying to murder this man. Um, and then like oh I wrote God. like another whole half a page. I'm not actually going to read the whole thing, but um, there are a lot of quotes where she described like what the UFO was like, what the people there were like. It sounded pretty much like a utopia, like just perfect heaven. She described everything all the way down to like what the carpets were like and how they had like kind of a trampoline springiness to them. Oh, that's um, fun. The walls apparently changed color when you would like walk into the room. Like, um, that's so cool. I mean, she wrote, I, I, I have it here, but it's just a lot. Um, I, she did an interview a while ago. Um, uh, on a, a website called, uh, Zaman Zamanda Yalka look. Okay. Well, that, sure. that's okay. But there was an interview <laughs> where she answered a lot of questions from like, were they armed? What did they eat? Apparently one of the things she was like, <clears throat> they eat very simple food, but boy, do they love their wine. And I was like, I'm pretty sure Christine is on board. Um, I'm actually on board the mothership already. <laughs> I'm on board all the way to meet on. And one of the questions was, um, uh, they were, she was asked if they had anything to do with Atlantis or Lemuria, which if you listen to my <gasps> Mount Shasta yes. and Lemurian episodes, you'll know what I'm talking about. Um, and she said that they are somehow involved. They are earlier descendants of those ancient civilizations. Wow. So okay. You can find all that at the, the link below i'll also add the link to the um the interview she did so just so you guys have all all of it but wow the wow, end wow <laughs> anyway there's a list of clearer i am just like you told me you were excited to tell your story i had zero percent clue what you were going to talk about I mean, especially i think afterwards i still don't totally know what you were talking about so how fun I didn't ever plan to to read something so X-rated, which like it really wasn't very X-rated. It but wasn't even that coming bad, out of my mouth and my soul felt wrong for talking about it. So. It doesn't <laughs> feel super good, especially when we have a camera on us. Yeah, I think maybe maybe not. But um, I'm very proud of you for getting through that. Thank you. I apologize for my nervous laughter, but it could not be stopped. So oh, it <laughs> it, it was not, not going to be stopped. <laughs> Okay, well, I am. I have like the butterflies in my stomach. I'm very excited about my story today. All right, let's hear it. What's it about today? I am going to cover for you, and this is supposed to be your birthday gift, um, <gasps> but it, it a lot of other things happened instead. I am covering Jeffrey Dahmer <gasps> today. No way! I'm so excited. I've been working on this for a long time. Wow, and that is a happy birthday. I'm so glad because listen. June just ended last week and I'm still better. So this, yeah. thank you for this gift. 
It's been a rough year, folks. I figure I might as well just throw a Jeffrey Dahmer in here and see what happens. Blend it up with everything else going on. Don't you do that. Also, like how I was I'm shocked this isn't like a two parter. Yeah, you know what? It's it's I would manage to make it pretty succinct. I mean, it's a big one, obviously, um, but it's all like under one big umbrella. So I didn't I didn't see I've never done a two parter before, like before those two separate cases I did last time. So I don't know how to split a two parter. That's okay. I'm excited. I'm very, very excited. I want to so you're just gonna have to listen to me talk for a long time. Awesome. I uh-huh. I know that this is uh, obviously like a notorious case, but I I'm just happy that I finally know kind of about a case before you tell me about it. So I can like pretend to join in on some of the info. Um, Yeah, no, I mean, you've wanted me to cover this for so long and it took me forever to get here. So let's go for you. Okay. So we begin, I'm going to start this story off July 22nd, 1991 at approximately at approximately 1130 PM, 32 year old Tracy Edwards flags down two Milwaukee police officers named Mueller and Roth who note the handcuffs attached to the man's wrists. Edwards tells the officers of the quote, weird dude in apartment 213 who likes watching the exorcist three and says that he's the man who put the cuffs on him and then threatened to kill him with a large knife. Okay. So the police attempt to remove the cuffs off of Tracy, and uh, their key doesn't fit the cuffs that are on his wrists. So instead, they decide to take Edwards back to the apartment, 213, um, to get the handcuff key. (laughs) What? Okay. (laughs) Okay. Well, It's insane. I'm going to keep my mouth shut. Let's go. (laughs) Feel free to stop me because I feel like this becomes a very big like timeline thing. So if there's anything that you feel like I no, I just over. I'm just like, why on earth would you? Why wouldn't you just like take him to the station and like crow like, like crowbar him out of them or something, or, something. or like or like leave him at the the car and go check yourself for the key, like not right. bring him back up. Like it just seems so Clear- wild to me, but <laughs> clearly he's escaped from something dark. So like, why bring him? Yeah. Back? Okay. Exactly. But they do. And he goes. Um, So the trio arrives at 924 North 25th Street, which is where Jeffrey Dahmer lived, apartment 213. And Edwards shows them the apartment. And the police officers finally get to meet the, quote, weird dude. This weird dude is a 31-year-old, six-foot-tall blonde man. And he's the sole occupant of the foul-smelling apartment. (laughs) And he acknowledges that, yes, he did put the handcuffs on Edwards. And he says, I'll go retrieve the keys. They're in the bedroom. So Edwards uh, tells Mueller and Roth that the bedroom is where the knife is located. And Roth decides, you know what? No, I'm going to stay in the living room with Tracy Edwards and the weird dude. So the victim and the weird dude, the Dahmer, while Mueller goes to the bedroom to retrieve the keys. Like, (laughs) we don't want to let this guy out of our sight. Right, right. So Mueller goes to the bedroom and he sees the knife kind of, there's actually a photo of it, um, a crime scene photo. The knife is underneath the bed. So he sees the knife. He grabs the handcuff keys from the nightstand, but something catches his eye in an open drawer. He sees a number of Polaroid photographs of deceased young men and teens in various stages of dissection. Oh, my God. Yeah. So I like I knew that because it's Jeffrey Dahmer, (laughs) but like I'm still it's still shocking. And uh, yeah, it's one of the things that I feel like we get kind of numb to maybe because like you just hear about his name so often. And then when you get into the details, you're like, oh, dear God, that was really already I. I forgot. I didn't realize that it was 1991. It was like literally the year you were born that this happened. Yeah. It, it, it is a lot more recent, um, that he was caught than it sometimes feels. I think. Yeah. I I put him in like Ted Bundy era. So like I think of him in like the seventies or eighties and that's a good point. And then also with like, uh, I didn't realize he was only 31. Like it grosses me out that I'm so close in age to him. I didn't even think about that either. Yeah. Um, he did start in the 80s, uh, uh, I will say that, but you're right, like, uh, the, the ni- he was caught in 91, so I guess he kind of was early 90s, but mostly in the 80s. Mm. But yeah, he was really young. He was really young. And he did a lot for such a young man. Um, oh, very accomplished in his craft. Very. Yikes. Yeah, he's a 30 under 30 uh, oh my in God. his own right. <laughs> <laughs> Forbes Forbes's least proud list. Yeah, 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 yeah. We don't put him on uh we don't put him in the magazine. <laughs> so, 
uh, he sees these Polaroids and uh, he wa- Mueller walks out with the Polaroids and the weird dude sees them, uh, sees that this officer is holding them and he tries to make a run for it. But mm. the officers thankfully subdue him, put their own handcuffs on him <laughs> and they call for a second car for backup. So Edwards, uh, before they go, Edwards says, hey, there's something horrible in the refrigerator that maybe you should look at. So Roth continues to pin the man to the floor as Mueller opens the fridge and he lets out a scream at the sight of a severed human head resting on the bottom shelf of the fridge. Okay, I love that the friend or the not the friend, the the <clears throat> cop's partner was like, something's in there. I'm not going to tell you what. Just- no, no, sorry. The the victim said that. Oh, I see. So I like that there was no warning. Just like some things in the fridge. It's kind of disturbing. Go check it out. Which also, I'm like, I wonder how he knew that the victim. Because right. like he had been uh, drugged and subdued. And I wonder how he kind of mm. like saw what was in the fridge. Like maybe. I, in my brain, I don't- he, like when they first got up to his apartment, he like went to grab a beer and then almost freaked out. And that's when Jeffrey Dahmer <laughs> drugged him. That's a really good him. point. You know, that's a really good point. I mean, it could very well have been that. Um, so he basically, right. So the victim is like, by the way, before we head out of here, like you should check the fridge. And then the one officer is like, I'll stay with the weird guy. Uh-huh. You can go check the fridge. Um, he literally screamed uh, and found a human head on the bottom shelf. Goodbye. So they arrest the weird dude. Turns out, no surprise, his name is Jeffrey Dahmer. And as they arrest him and lead him outside, Dahmer turns his head to the officer and says, for what I did, I should be dead. Wow. Okay. And that is the prelude to this story. I see what you're doing here. Very cinematic of you. I'm trying, you know, try to keep things a little like. That would be uh, in like the Marvel world. Like they would like zoom in on him saying that. And then all of a sudden, like the Marvel comic book, like theme would like show up. (gasps) I love that. Okay. Or I'm thinking more of like Nickelodeon where like, you're probably wondering how we ended up with the head in the fridge. (laughs) Like record scratch. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. So record scratch and comic book flip. Um, I'm going to go back, tell you a little bit about our friend Jeff uh, and his upbringing, Mm -hmm. which is just all wildly interesting to me um, from like the day he was born all the way till the end. So, So, uh, well, before you start, I did watch, I'll never know the name of it. So before you shout them at me, um, because there's so many documentaries about Jeffrey mm-hmm. Dahmer. I'll I'll never know which one it was that I saw, but I saw a movie version about his life where he like it showed him like living with his grandma for a while and like Yeah. So I I I've s I kinda know what's going on. So hopefully I'm helpful instead of just Honestly, like I didn't think I knew anything really about him because I felt like I'd never really looked him up but then as I was watching those docu same documentaries I was like oh yeah I kind of know what happens next and I don't know why yeah that I must have like seen this before <laughs> I don't know it's weird he's okay. just very pervasive <laughs> I feel like everyone knows kind of something and then like our collective subconscious can build out the story right exactly um yeah yeah not that he deserves it but no here we are so Jeffrey Dahmer uh, Jeffrey Lionel Dahmer mm. was born May 21st, 1960. Um, another Gemini for us, I believe. Yeah. At the, right on the cusp we there, don't claim, I think. We don't claim him. <laughs> we don't. There are a lot of them that um, we don't claim. So most of the Geminis don't claim each other, I guess, right. is what it boils down to. A lot of them hurt us. A lot of them, they didn't They didn't give us a good name. <laughs> so. Yeah, no, they're not really giving us a good rap. I think. Uh, I think nobody can deny that. So he's born May 21st, 1960 to Joyce and Lionel Dahmer in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. uh, Joyce and Lionel, his parents, both have advanced educations. They're considered affluent in their community. Uh, Joyce had a lot of uh, medical issues. So she, during her pregnancy with Dahmer, had been on 20 or more medications. Mm. Uh, Yeah, exactly. And she was suffering from um, a couple mental illnesses. And she also had various unnamed physical ailments that we're not really sure what they were. And so, I mean, like back then too, there were a lot of things people didn't even know were dangerous during pregnancy. And so if being on 20 plus medications, who knows what those were, right. Um, probably not great, but, um, obviously there's no for sure way to know if that had anything to do with it, but for what it's worth, Jeffrey did appear to be a happy and energetic child in 1964. He had a surgery for a double hernia. So he's only four years old. Wow. 
And after the surgery, his demeanor immediately changed, which that often happens, I feel like, with a head injury. But right. this surprised me. I mean, maybe he was traumatized. I don't know um, if something happened. But apparently he uh, changed from, like, a happy, energetic child to a really shy and subdued boy. Okay. So uh, in 1966, when he was six years old, the Dahmer family moved to Doylestown, Ohio, and uh, Joyce gave birth to another son. And Jeffrey's parents said, you get to name your little brother, Aww. which I feel like is cute until maybe something until your right. six year old it's, actually names your child. It's cute <laughs> feel- and very brave, <laughs> very brave and also very probably brave. pretty dumb. Um <laughs> I don't know what the hell I would have named, like unicorn or something, like right. Lisa Frank. I don't know what I would have named my SpongeBob, younger sibling. Like- <laughs> SpongeBob. Oh my god, Squidward. I think is probably what I would have gone with. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Jeffrey, instead of doing something creative, names his little brother David. Okay. So I, I guess his parents were lucky with that one, right? When David was born, uh, Jeffrey became even more withdrawn and actually started to feel pretty neglected by his parents. His teacher even wrote a letter home being like, hey, your son is is expressing that he's feeling pretty neglected at home. Um, And in 1968, the family moved. So Joyce and Lionel were constantly fighting. The marriage was deteriorating. And uh, Jeffrey recounted later that that had a really uh, big impact on him, basically, Mm -hmm. like his parents... uh, marriage falling apart. Um, and a lot of people point to that too, but then part of me is like a lot of people's parents get divorced and go through really bad, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be a murderer. Uh, (laughs) but yeah, here we are. So the family moved to, um, a large wooded lot, uh, in Bath Township, Ohio. And it's around this time that Jeff, he's about eight years old, he becomes fascinated by the sound that small animal bones make uh, as his father cleans them out from under the house. Uh Uh-huh. So he starts hearing the noises and he becomes really fascinated in how they sound and also how they fit together. Also, how many, sorry, how many bones are under your goddamn porch where like there's enough for an ASMR (laughs) where you're like, oh, I love the sound of dead skeletons clacking together it's like it's like later in your life and you're like uh this oh it always reminds me of the good old days when pop pop would like uh <laughs> clean clear the skeletons from under the porch. all of the birds and bunnies would just be shoved into a bag together like <laughs> ew <laughs> they did live out in the middle of the woods um so i mean i guess that's part of the problem like mice and and sure. rodents and uh voles i don't know just for it to be that many that there's a a clear enough sound and for it to happen so often that it becomes a fond memory that he develops yeah yeah uh yeah it's no it's no not great um and part of me is like that's not necessarily bad in and of itself in the context it's no really bad but like in general if your kid is interested in skeletons and anatomy it's like okay that's probably a good thing that, i mean you know ev- it's us and everyone listening to the show is interested in death a little bit so like exactly like, he, so far jeffrey Dahmer gets a pass so far that's a good point i mean we've said this before <laughs> but if one of us became a murderer like they would make a movie being like well look at all the signs you know so we definitely like, offer a lot of signs you know we definitely offer up a lot, um, probably way too much, some might say, mm-hmm. um, but too late. Pandora's box has been opened <laughs> in episode one of this stupid podcast. <laughs> okay. So, you know, all the skeletons. And later, Lionel would reportedly allege that around this time, a neighbor boy molested Jeffrey, but Jeffrey denied the, the event ever taking place. Um, and Lionel later said, oh, no, I never said that. So it's kind of a weird fact where it was mentioned once and then both of them denied that that ever happened so it's hard to tell whether that was truth or not uh jeffrey later uh identifies this time as when he became aware that he was different i see (laughs) i see gay in 19 (laughs) what gay is that what we're talking about Oh, I mean, I think it's probably a number of things. However, gay is definitely one of them. Okay, gotcha. I think also maybe the bones identified something within himself that was also different. Um, But also, like, right now, like, he's discovering that he is a child of near divorce, queer, and likes, like, like 
true crime. So it sounds like us. So, right. <laughs> well, it's, at least it's, me on the queer front, but <laughs> yes, you're right. It's, it's, it's like a troubling thing. And then you're like, well, well, and I'm like, Andy's in Ohio. Andy's a Gemini. Right. I mean, listen, Wait we're a not minute. that far off. <laughs> I'm waiting for you to tell me like the twist here is that their name is actually like M. Schultz. So <laughs> wait till the last page. You never know. That would be a twist. Um, so in 1970, one night during a family dinner, Jeffrey asks his father, who, by the way, is a chemist. So at this point, his dad is like amped that his kid is so into science and like bones and anatomy, yada, yada. So he asks his dad, um, what would bleach do to chicken bones? And his father, trying to encourage academic interest, uh, proceeds to show him how to preserve bones with a bleach solution. Okay. So uh, Jeffrey begins to practice with chemicals like acid to strip the meat off of bones of roadkill that he finds and preserve the skeletons. This is when I think as a parent I would start to get a little more concerned. Um, this is when as a parent I would wonder if I'm parenting well. <laughs> I'd be like – Right, exactly. For like to teach uh, him the skill and for it to be the only skill he's really like taken a knack for <laughs> – Right, like this could have gone so well in another universe where like he becomes the next, you know, great scientist to cure right. cancer, but instead it went a really bad way. <laughs> um, so in 1971, Jeffrey began to kill the animals uh, in order to uh, preserve their corpses. Of course. And that's obviously when things start to go really south. He started displaying the corpses in really gruesome manners. So he would, for example, impale them. Uh, decapitate them sometimes he would crucif crucify them and nail them to trees so it got a little dark um one neighbor actually remembers jeffrey creating and maintaining a small cemetery at the side of the house where he would bury all the animals he killed that's <laughs> when a as a parent i'd be like okay like you had your interest <laughs> and now it's and now it's done and now my rose bush has a gravestone in it. Right. Because for a squirrel. Not because there was a dead squirrel, but because you killed a squirrel and put it there. You made a dead squirrel. Yes. Right. Yeah. It's bad. So in 1972, when Jeffrey was 12, uh, he gets his first job uh, selling shrubbery. Um, in 1973, he begins to drink daily as his parents' relationship further deteriorates. So he's 13 at this point, and he is drinking heavily. Okay. Like very heavily. In 1974, he says that is when he realizes he is gay. And th so at 14. And then throughout high school, um, Jeffrey, Jeffrey had a very interesting um, high school experience. So he uh, was basically considered the class clown, which is kind of surprising because he seemed a little bit like a loner. And a lot yeah. of people described him as isolated. But he was considered the class clown. Um Although he did drink constantly throughout school every day. Got it. Like he would literally just keep booze in his locker. Like a flask. <laughs> right. Or like anything. Apparently a classmate said he will drink anything he can find. He'll just oh. take it to school and drink it. Like He's troubled. It didn't matter. He's very troubled. Okay. Yeah, it's not good. Not good. Uh -huh. On a class trip to a science museum, Jeffrey finds himself aroused by the sight of a bisected human. Um, hmm. and what really does it for him is apparently the quote, slick sheen of viscera. So basically what? the sliminess of one's guts goodbye is what turns him on. Okay. Well, yeah. I already hated the word moist and yeah. now, <laughs> now it's just taken on a whole other level of disgust to me. And skin slippage. You hated that one too. And here we are. No, and I hate the word. Well, yeah, that my... Everyone's like, for the most part, everyone hates the word moist. I hate the word flap. Oh, and that's true. There's a lot going on here that you don't like. Especially when you put them together, moist flaps. I hate that. <laughs> and like now all you've told me is he's aroused by moist flaps. <laughs> so <laughs> no, thank you. My bad. Ugh. So he starts to fantasize about having intercourse with a corpse and um, despite being kind of categorized as a loner nowadays, um, he was actually pretty popular for all of his class clown antics. He did have a close group of friends at school. Some of his pranks uh, included faking seizures, uh, which doesn't Hysterical. sound like quite a prank to me. Um, however, I did know somebody who did that in school. It was very scary and bad. Um, 
Yikes. He would yell randomly. Uh, he would. So apparently he did this thing where he'd be in the library and it was like really strict librarian. And um, he would. And since he was considered like kind of the quiet shy kid, he would scream her name and then just look back at his book. And the librarian would like whip around and be like, who said that? And like nobody would say anything. And I actually thought that was quite funny because like apparently he just did that to her a lot. If I were in high school, um, that would have been the funniest thing I've ever seen in my life. Right. Like, <laughs> like I was amused by that, honestly. <laughs> um, I would never have done it because I'm a big baby, but uh, I would have been amused. And all the people who were amused by his antics um, created a Jeff Dahmer fan club. Get which nowadays out. has way different connotations than it did back then. Imagine how uncomfortable everyone in that original group yes. now feels. They're like, oh, can you imagine? They probably like made pins and stuff back in the seventies. Oh like. my gosh. <laughs> um, so they also called his pranks. If you, if you did a prank like that at school, you were doing a Dahmer. So he was quite popular. Um, he would, yeah, okay, so he would sneak into yearbook photos. This is one that people often know, and um, we'll put a photo up, but he would sneak into yearbook photos that he wasn't involved in, like of groups that he wasn't involved in. And <laughs> he did this to like tons of different groups, um, including the Honor Society, which made me ah. laugh. Uh, <laughs> he like oh, snuck good. in and he just kind of sat, stood there very solemnly, like in the Jeffrey Dahmer way and just stood in the middle of the group. And apparently someone who did the uh, yearbook got really upset and started. And so he sharpied out all the, the faces of him in every group photo, which makes it extra creepy now. Cause it's like Jeffrey Dahmer's face, like scribbled out in everybody's yeah. yearbook. So I thought that was kind of funny too before the whole scratching his face off. But (laughs) he also played clarinet in the school band. He competed in intramural tennis. Like he was still pretty active for being like, you know, kind of a weird kid. Mm -hmm. Um, During a junior year trip to Washington, D.C., Jeffrey called the vice president's office like of the United States pretending to be someone important. And he landed uh, him and two of his friends a VIP tour. Uh, of the White House. I imagine like it was so much easier to get away with shit like that. When That's there probably was, true. When there was no like real security, like at least compared to today. And also there was no caller ID and no internet to like verify information. No internet. So like there was also like no like real IDing anyone. If they just said a name, you just kind of trusted it if there was confidence behind it. So exactly. I mean, that's pr- uh, still very impressive. Like, still a great story. Uh, like, also, you got to be really ballsy to do that, I think. Yeah, I to think. To call the White House. <laughs> they just assumed, like, why Why would someone do, would do exactly. that? Exactly. Why would a child do that? Um, in 1977, uh, when he's 17 years old, Lionel, uh, Lionel moved. Sorry, when Dahmer, 17 years old, Jeffrey, his father moves out of the family home um, because he and Joyce are filing for divorce. And there's a really long, drawn-out custody battle for David, the younger son. And apparently this divorce like really screwed up, screwed up, screwed with Jeffrey's head, I Got guess it, yeah. is a good way to put it. Um, he was an average student and despite his increasing alcohol dependency um, to cope with his his parents' marriage and divorce, um, his fen- friends and classmates, for the most part, a lot of whom were like interviewed in some of these movies, uh, saw him as just a normal guy who sometimes did something like goofy or strange for attention. Um, he went to prom with a girl and, uh, attended his graduation. He was just like a normal kid on the surface, but inwardly, maybe not so much. So it's about this time that he starts imagining these elaborate fantasies about hitchhikers and joggers with quote, Chippendale swimmer body types. And his fantasies would involve complete control over these men, and in some cases, death of the fantasized individual prior to performing sexual acts on them. Okay. So I think we can see where this is going. We can see clearly where this is going, yes. You're painting <laughs> yeah, quite a picture. <laughs> I'm just kind of <clears throat> dumping the paint onto the canvas and saying, look, it's a mess. Right, 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 right. Um, so just after Jeffrey's graduation in 1978, Joyce takes David, the younger son and moves to Chippewa Falls, Wisconsin. And since his father had already moved out and was staying at a hotel until the divorce was finalized, Jeffrey just lived in the family home by himself at like age 18. Okay. So on June 18th, 1978, Jeffrey is driving home drunk when he, 
as fate would have it, spots a handsome, bare-chested young man hitchhiking to a concert. Uh oh. And this is sort of where he said in one of the one of his um, not confessions. Well, I guess sort of a confession, but when he described his past, he right. explained this as like being fate, where he. He thought, like, I shouldn't do that, but if it happens, it happens. And then he's like, I was driving and saw, like, my perfect fantasy walking Yikes. down the street. My perfect prey. My perfect prey. So he offers the young man, whose name is Stephen Hicks, um, he's 18 years old. He offers him a ride and asks if he want to, wants to smoke some marijuana at his place. And Stephen's like, sure. Um, they have a few beers, they smoke some pot, and then uh, Jeffrey says he realized pretty quickly that Stephen was not gay, so there was not a chance that, you know, he'd be interested in hooking up. So when Stephen said he wanted him to leave, Jeffrey kind of panicked and was like, I don't want him to go, I want him to stay with me. And he had this, like, fear of abandonment, so worried that he'd be abandoned, Jeffrey grabbed a 10-pound barbell and hit Stephen over the head with it, and then continued to strangle him with the barbell. <sighs> Until he was dead. Yikes. So at this point, um, Jeffrey just jumps right in and dismembers the body. Uh, and <laughs> really just full steam ahead. It's full steam ahead. Like, this is fate. Like, no, it's it's you doing this, not fate. Wow. Um, you're just, you've just been thinking about this for a long time. <clears throat> so he dismembers the body and then he uh, performs sexual acts on Stephen after death. Uh, he then wraps the pieces in plastic and buries them in the backyard of the family house. So that's cute. Oh, I guess with the graveyard, there was that little cemetery. Already had it all built up. Yes. How disturbing is that? Oh How my disturbingly God. convenient is that? Yeah, exactly. The neighbor's like, oh, I saw his little cemetery for animals. And it's like, well, well, well. it's getting added. There's, we're doing a, <laughs> we're flipping it. Yeah. We're doing a renovation. Uh, <laughs> Yikes. Yeah. No good. So in July 1978, Joyce and Lionel's divorce is finalized and Jeffrey digs up Stephen's decomposed remains. He then removes and dissolves the flesh that's still on the body, places the bones between a set of sheets and pulverizes them with a sledgehammer. He then takes these shattered bone fragments and scatters them along a ravine in the woods behind his house. So Stephen Hicks, who uh, was his first victim, and he was just shy of his 19th birthday, uh, was his was Jeffrey Dahmer's first ever victim, and nobody, unfortunately, ever reported the young man missing. So Aww. very sad. Um, and there was a point in uh, the Netflix documentary that came out this year uh, about Dahmer. They're still making them, I tell you. Uh, <laughs> the where they interviewed Lionel, the the dad, Jeffrey's dad, and he said um, when he learned that uh jeffrey's first murder took place in their family home like their childhood home he was like it was the most disturbing feeling like he did this under our roof in our home which is just i can't imagine yikes like knowing you're just yeah. walking around in a place that like has so much energy and like you're not aware of yes. it yes i mean first the animals and then just like total escalation um, so in 1978, in August, Lionel and his fiance Sherry, move uh, back to the Bath Township home, and they find Jeffrey living there alone. Um, at this point, obviously, they don't know he just murdered someone in the house. Um, he, at the end of that month, Dahmer enrolls at OSU. O H I O um, at Ohio State <laughs> University to major in business, and uh, he moved to Columbus, Ohio. And at the end of November 1978, Dahmer dropped out of OSU because he failed all his classes except for one. And I want you to guess, I mean, it's so random, but do you have any guess which class he got a B minus in? Uh, something involving, oh, if it's random, then no. I was going to say something involving like biology or like dissecting. That's a good point, though. I mean... It looks like he literally failed all of his classes, including science, but he did get a B minus in riflery. Oh. So there well, you go. He never used a gun as a weapon, so that would make sense. Why? Maybe he got an A I guess in, in cutlery or something. <laughs> exactly. That's a good point. Um, so in January of 1979, so he's out of OSU at this point, out of college, and at the behest of his father, he enlists in the U.S. Army, where he trains as a medical specialist in Texas. And uh, by July of 1979, he's stationed in Germany. And while he's there, his drinking worsens. 
And although there's no confirmed violent incidences during this time, uh, two men have since come forward 30 years later saying that he had beat, beaten, abused, drugged, and raped them. Oh, wow. And uh, subsequent investigations by journalists have been unable to corroborate their, the men's experiences, but also like that seems like a really hard thing to corroborate 30 years later. Yeah. So I absolutely don't discount that um, at all. Okay. Uh, in March of 1981, Dahmer receives an honorable discharge from service under Chapter 9 of the Code of Military Justice, which covers alcohol abuse. So oh. that kind of was his ticket out of the military. And he was sent to South Carolina for debriefing, and then he was offered a plane ticket to go anywhere in the world. That's a lie. Anywhere in the country. Okay. So. I was like, uh, okay, well. Yeah. That, that sounds <laughs> like quite a deal. <laughs> yeah. Anywhere in the world's a little much, especially if the U.S. Army is sending you just like on a whim. Right. But anywhere in the U.S. he was allowed to go. Got it. So after his debriefing, he chose to go to Miami Beach, Florida, which, okay, I guess that makes sense. Sure. I mean, probably better than going back to Ohio. No offense uh, to me. Um, from the end of March 1981 until September of the same year, Dahmer works at a deli and lead, lives at a motel until, until his drinking leads to his eviction. And this is when he calls his dad and asks for a plane ticket home. So he moves back home with his father and now stepmother in 1981. And pretty much right away, he's arrested for disorderly conduct for drinking in public and he pleads guilty, pays 60 bucks. Life goes on. In December of that year, he moves in instead with his grandmother okay. um, in West Dallas, Wisconsin. So this is the part that you mentioned uh, kind of remembering. Yes. yes. I, so I, don't moves, re I don't remember anything else except that he was there and like at some point there was a, a body or something under the bed. I don't remember. You would be exactly correct. Okay. Yes. So his grandmother um, temporarily does have a positive influence on his life. And when he moved in with her, he basically, he later said he thought to himself, like, this is my chance to fix things and, you know, be a good Christian again. And so he starts going to church with her. Um, but obviously that does not last very long. And uh, pretty quickly uh, things go downhill again. So he's working at this point as a phlebotomist in a blood plasma center. So probably exactly down his alley. Yep. And then uh, later that year, he exposes himself to a crowd of 25 people, including children, at the Wisconsin State Fair Park. Ooh. And he said, actually he explained this at one point, thinking like he had these urges and he's like, so I thought maybe by exposing myself, I would uh, fulfill that urge without having to kill somebody. So that wow. was like actually his way of trying to avoid violence, okay. which is very interesting. Okay. Um. So he tried, uh, didn't work. Uh, in September of 82, he's fired from the plasma center. And then in 84, he's trying, he's still trying to like, uh, quell these urges, I guess you would say. Okay. So the next thing he tries is he, uh, goes into a department store dressing room and waits there until closing. Then when the store is closed, he sneaks out and steals a male mannequin uh, puts it in a sleeping bag to steal it and take it home and begins to use it as a sex doll. And uh, it worked until his grandmother found it and made him throw it away. <laughs> How? Uh, I doesn't, it doesn't I matter. Know. Okay, it doesn't matter. I literally don't know. And at one point, I mean, I don't want to, well, spoiler alert, he uses a skull also to sexually gratify himself. So I'm like, I, I don't know okay. the anatomy of how any of this is working, but apparently... He's, do it's he's working. doing something. He's doing something that he's enjoying. Um, and you know what? If it's with a mannequin, great. Yeah, uh, I'd rather be a mannequin than a dead body. Than a person, right. So in January of 85, um, he finally gets a steady job. He's working the night shift at the Ambrosia Chocolate Factory. So that's fun. That sounds fun. In 85, he discovers the LGBTQ2S so lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, transsexual, queer, questioning, and two-spirit um, oh. scene in Milwaukee, uh, which at the time was called the gay club scene, but obviously since then has been redefined for obvious reasons. Um, and it was known at the time as the gay club scene in Milwaukee, and he would frequent these clubs, bars, and the bathhouse. Uh, and he has a series of one-night stands, but he is always disappointed when their time together ends because he just wants somebody is going to stay with him and he says they never wanted to stay and he wanted like control of them and that so that he could tell them where to go what to do 
uh, not to leave him ever. You know, he just wanted control over somebody. Um, and in June of 1986, Dahmer finally discovers he can do what he wants if he drugs the people that he's having one night stands with. Bingo. <clears throat> there it is. Uh, so he does this at least a dozen times uh, during these days. He uses this sleeping pill. Uh, it's a benzo, but it uses a sleeping pill called Halcyon. And he starts drugging uh, the people he's sleeping with and uh, then raping them. And this pretty quickly gets found out. And he is uh, his membership to the bathhouse is revoked. Oh, good. Because can they, yeah, I know. Good. Well, the, least, the least we could do. Because um, they said consent... The one thing that mattered there was that no meant no, um, which I was like, okay. They were like, do whatever you want. We don't judge, but no means no. So he broke the the one and only rule. Well, thank God for that. At least they have a a good a good untarnished name after this story. Yeah, exactly. So he, this is wild. This is like the epitome of a fun fact that uh, is not fun. Oh hell yeah. Um, he reads in the newspaper that an eighteen year old boy. Uh, recently died and he reads where the funeral was held and he decides he's going to go dig up the body. Cause again, he's trying to find ways to do this without murdering somebody. Right. I see. So yeah. So he tries, but the ground is too hard and he is unable to take the body out of the ground, which is good, I guess. Um, at this point he kind of finally realizes like his overarching goal and that is a, he wants never ending companionship with a human who he sees whom he sees and uses as an object that is under his complete control. Okay. So that is what he defines as like his ultimate desire. So a slave? Sort of, yeah. Like but a also sex like slave? a lover. Yeah. Okay. Y- yeah, but also like um actually he describes it later as a zombie. He wanted to create like a zombie who and he tried, by the way, we'll get to that. But he wanted to create like a zombie who he could fully control and manipulate and regardless of was, what of what you were doing in your relationship with them like right didn't have to be about sex just all just total control always yes because okay. sometimes he wanted them to just lay with him and they didn't want to do that and he got gotcha. like really upset and would drug them or beat them to make them like lay with him gotcha um so in august of 1986 Dahmer is arrested again this time for masturbating in front of two young boys near the local river. He says he was just urinating and they believe him. So they change it to disorderly conduct and he receives one year probation and in order to undergo professional counseling. In November of 1987, Dahmer picks up 25 year old Steve Tuomi at a Milwaukee bar and the two head over to Dahmer's room at the ambassador hotel So at this point, uh, Dahmer says he had intended to just, quote unquote, uh, drug and rape Tuomi, Um, but he thinks he got some of the drug in his own drink by accident, and he doesn't remember what happened, and he woke up from a drunken blackout on top of Steve Tuomi, who was beaten and dead. Oh, shit. So Dahmer had bruises on his arms and he concluded that he had killed the young man, but didn't remember it. Wow. Okay. So at this point, he locks the room of the hotel, goes to the store and buys a suitcase, uh, puts Steve's body inside the suitcase, has a cab take him to his grandmother's house. He even describes that the poor valet put the suitcase in the trunk for him. Um, And when he gets to his grandma's house, he just puts the the body in the suitcase in his grandma's basement. Hmm. So about eight days later, he disposes of Tuomi's body. And first what he does is he severs the appendages from the torso. You know how I feel about a torso. No, thank you. Oh, yeah, I know. (sighs) So he severs the appendages from the torso, including the head. Then he removes the bones and he cuts the flesh into pieces and puts them into small plastic bags. Then uh, he wraps the bones up and annihilates them with a sledgehammer like he did back in 78. And finally, he, I mean, he had a thing for bones, if you recall. Oh, I remember. <laughs> I, yeah. Oh, you remember? Was, oh, I, that was not forgotten. None of this has been <laughs> forgotten. None of this will leave any of our brains probably for the rest of Maybe time. Maybe that he was bad at riflery or whatever. Like, <laughs> <laughs> oh. Finally, he bags everything up, including, I'm sorry, excluding the head in a garbage can on his grandmother's street, just like for casual garbage day. 
Uh, December 5th, 1987, Dahmer boils the head in a chemical mixture and keeps the defleshed, which is probably my f- new least favorite word. Deep flesh? The, no, sorry, defleshed. <gasps> so like, yeah, isn't that bad? That's terrible. Defleshed. Yeah. Yuck. It's bad. So uh, he keeps the defleshed skull to pleasure himself with. Okay. Yikes. Okay, so we've made it to that part of the story. I see. We've gotten we've gotten pretty damn far, and it just keeps getting worse. Mm-hmm. Uh, trust me. So until it becomes too brittle, uh, and then he smashes it up and disposes of it. Oh no. Okay. I know. I know. I know. I know. I know. So Steve Twomey is reported missing shortly after by friends and family who realizes who realize they can't find him. Um. And this is about the time when he establishes his hunting grounds, quote unquote, um, in and around the Milwaukee uh, club and bar scene, which at the time was called the gay scene. Um, In January of 1988, Dahmer lures, this is, okay. He lures 14 year old James Doxater to his grandmother's house with the promise of $50 if he would model for him. Okay. In his grandmother's basement, he drugs 14-year-old James and then strangles him. Uh, He leaves the body in the basement for a week, then disposes of it the same way he did with Twomey. And he kept the skull uh, again until it became too brittle. Holy shit. Okay. Yeah. In uh, March of 1988, Dahmer meets a uh, bisexual 22-year-old man, uh, and his name is Richard Guerrero, and he is at the popular gay nightclub, Club 219, and uh, he's interviewed in in some of these documentaries. Okay. Uh, Dahmer lures Richard back to his grandmother's basement with the... Oh, sorry, this is the wrong Richard. He is not interviewed because, unfortunately, he he does not survive this. I was thinking of Robert, who we'll get to next. Okay. My mistake. Damn. How many names are there? Jesus. And so many. (sighs) So many. It's bad. So uh, Richard Guerrero, uh, he's lured back to his grandmother's basement with the promise of $50 if he spends the night hanging out with him. Uh, Once they're in the basement, he drugs Richard and strangles him with a leather strap, um, after which Dahmer engages in necrophilia with Richard's corpse. And then within 24 hours, the body is dismembered and disposed of again, except for the skull, Uh uh, which we've learned the pattern pretty quickly. Um, And he later destroys the skull once it has become too brittle for his liking. So this has just happened like three times in a row. So at at what point did he... Because it seems like he had some guilt and tried to avoid this for a while. At what point did he just go like, I don't fucking care. And every, it seems like every day it was happening instead of like, we're in the, we're in the the quick descent. So it was, no, you're totally right. Because when he moves to his grandmother's house, that's kind of when he starts being like, I'm going to change myself and I'm not going to do this anymore. And he really tried. I mean, not hard enough, obviously. Right. Um, but, but he really did do a lot of things that were kind of outside of his later like patterns just because he was trying not to murder anyone, which is interesting. I feel like it's very rare that you find some, like a serial killer who's like that self-aware almost. Right. Um, or who cares that much, I guess. Um, but yeah, it's basically once, um, once he, he murders, uh, Tuomi, he just kind of, plummets into uh, like he got a taste of it and it was too it was over yes exactly it was just he tried everything else he tried um drugging his victims he tried uh just raping people he tried uh, exposing himself like just nothing was enough quote unquote so he uh this is when it kind of we're kind of in the midst of it all just snowballing Mm. so april 23rd so i mean you're right this is back to this is less than a month later the next victim. It's like so quickly that this is happening. Um, on April 23rd of 1988, Dahmer lures another young man to his house and drugs his coffee. Um, however, his plans are interrupted when his grandmother sees him, uh, with the man after he has been drugged. So Dahmer drives him to the hospital and drops him off. And when the young man wakes up, he, this is the one I meant who was interviewed. Um, his name's Ronald Flowers, not Robert either. Clearly, I just can't remember their names. I'm hmm. so sorry about that. A lot of R's. Ronald, Fl- the, a lot of R's. Ronald Flowers, um, he wakes up in the hospital and he believes he's been sexually assaulted. He tries to report it to police. 
Um, and he believes, rightfully so, that the officers wouldn't file a report due to his sexuality and his race. And he is pretty much dismissed and not taken seriously, which, wow. as sad as it is, that's not even shocking to me. Um, yeah. It's, yeah. So um, he was interviewed in the most recent Netflix documentary uh, and kind of gave his side of the story, which is obviously really fascinating, but also just really fucked up. Um, so the April 23rd incident when, um, when his grandmother found him with this drugged victim, this drugged young man, the drunkenness, uh, the smells coming from his area of the house, uh, this has all taken a toll on his grandma and she's basically like, Hey, can you please move out? Like, I'm just trying to quilt and you're like ruining my life. And, (sighs) um, she doesn't know obviously that he's like murdering people. She just thinks he's living this like extreme lifestyle where he's like, you know, doing crazy drugs, having different people over every night, you know, et cetera. But it's actually so much worse than she thought. Wow. Yeah, for sure. So September 26th of 1988, Dahmer moves into an apartment at North North 25th street in Milwaukee. And, uh, the following day. So he's literally been in this apartment for one day. He lures a 13-year-old Laotian boy to his apartment where he drugs, photographs, and molests the boy before letting him go. Um, And then the day after that, he is arrested at his job and charged with sexually exploiting a child and second-degree assault. He is released on $2,500 bail, and his trial is set for May of 1989. But in January, he pleads guilty and... uh, on Easter break from work. So he, he was arrested at work, but he right. kept his job. So like, okay. And he was arrested and pleaded guilty, but he still kept his job, whatever. Um, he moved back in with his grandmother cause, uh, he didn't last very long at his new place. So March 25th, 1989, Dahmer meets 24 year old Anthony Sears at the end of the night, um, at a bar in town, They go to his grandmother's basement to have sex, and then Dahmer drugs and strangles him before engaging in necrophilia. Uh, This is a bad word. Uh, He flays the body. He what? He flays it. Flays it? Oh, God, yeah. Do I have to explain it to you? It's not a good thing. It's basically when you, like, cut and, like, fillet. It's like like, a fillet. No, F-L-A-Y. Flayed it. Like, it's like kind of opened it like a, sh- like a butcher, like with an animal. I think so. Okay. Well, now I'm making sure flay definition. This is like when I'm serious that my NSA person. Yeah. So you, <laughs> okay, exactly. You peel the skin off of something. Uh-huh. Okay. Which, great. Okay. I, okay. So okay. It, okay. I feel like it, it always reminds me of like medieval torture and stuff. I don't know. So, oh, that's exactly how I'm imagining it. So yes, yeah. we're on the same page. So he flays the body. He peels the skin off. He always had such a fascination with like insides that, you know, it just. It was a matter of time part, at this point. Yeah, it was a matter of time uh, for before he got into medieval torture uh, as part of his crimes. Yes. So um, he disposes of the body except for the head and genitals, which he preserves in acetone and keeps in his locker at work, which remember, please, that he works at a chocolate factory. <gasps> oh, my God. I'm so scared <laughs> of going into a chocolate store now. Can you imagine, like, edible arrangements having, like... (laughs) Oh, no. Oh, no. (laughs) Oh, no. Of all places to work, why would you ruin that for everybody else? Oh, gross. Why did he leave it there for safety? I I guess he didn't want his grandma to find it, maybe? He wanted the chocolatiers? He wanted Willy Wonka (laughs) to find it? Okay. (laughs) No. Okay, that's a good point. Oh, no. Also, like, that's the place where, like, at least your grandma, like, you probably can have, like, a compartment hidden somewhere in your room. But, like, when your boss probably has a master key to your locker, I can just, like, see a peen hanging out, like, on the shelf. Goodbye. Yeah. (laughs) See a peen hanging out in Willy Wonka's factory. Things got really dark and weird. I'm pouring more wine. Sorry. I'm not not peeing. I promise. (laughs) Um, So he explained later that he kept the body parts because he found Richard exceptionally attractive. So I guess oh, so he like just wanted he, he got he deserved to keep them in the afterlife. Yes, like he should be flattered that um that his body parts were that special, I guess. Jesus. Yikes. Oh my god. 
Yeah, it only gets worse. Um, May 23rd, 1989, Dahmer is sentenced to five years probation, um, one year in the House of Correction with work release, and he must register as a sex offender. Then in February of 1990, Lionel Dahmer sends a letter to the parole board requesting that they not release his son yet. Okay. So, which he actually reads in the documentary. Um, he begs, basically, he begs the parole board to get his son's psychological treatment prior to belie- to release because he is sure Jeffrey is mentally ill and will certainly reoffend if they let him back out. Wow. So I think that is like very telling that his own father is that concerned. Yeah. Um, his letter, unfortunately, received no response. At this point, how so many bodies good. does his dad know about? Um. I don't think he knows about any of the bodies. He just thinks about like him being him drinking and like disorderly conduct. Well, and also like the, the rape allegations and with the child, like he was um, arrested for uh, sexual exploitation of a child. So those are the things where his dad is like this, there's something wrong with my son and you shouldn't let him out. But uh, two months earlier than scheduled in March of 1990, Dahmer is released and he begins his probation period of five years. Okay. Um, two months later, he moves out of his grandma's house for the last time, and he moves into the apartment, 213, that we mentioned earlier, mm. and he brings with him all of his trophies. <laughs> so, trophies, uh, like genitalia and heads. Yes. Okay. The peen on the shelf. The peen. Um, at this point, nobody knows about these trophies because nobody knows that he is a murderer. Um, right. But does he keep he it in a box has- that says trophies? Like, how does he... <laughs> How does he store it? Like the I, R is backwards. <laughs> <laughs> How does he st- store these things? Like Tupperware? Like what keeps them fresh? Because at this point it's like I decomposed mean, he, balls, right? Well, he kept the one in acetone. He kept the peen in acetone. Okay. Um, but the head he kept, I guess, in the fridge and then the skulls would just end up breaking. So he probably didn't keep them very well. Did he uh, bubble wrap them? I mean, it's such a stupid thing to ask about, but it's like if I these don't were- think he took very good care of them. Um, you would think if these were his like prized possessions, like he might care about them a little bit. But then again, he's, I mean, you can find a skull anywhere, re- apparently. Exactly. Like he pretty quickly realized the skulls are expendable and he can just get another one. Terrible. Um, as horrific as that is. And the, the peen, he is kept especially in acetone in a jar to preserve it. So I think that's the only thing he's been like very careful about so far. And he has all the photos of like the little boy and all that. Right. Okay. So who knows what else the trophy box holds, but nothing good. Mm. Um, so in June of 1990, he offers 32 year old Raymond Smith $50 for sex. Once at his apartment, he proceeds with his usual method of drugging and strangulation and necrophilia. The following day, he purchases a Polaroid camera and photographs Raymond's dismemberment. Um, And so that became a new part of his pattern is that he would dismember the body, but he would photograph the process. Okay. To like look at later. Right, 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 right. Um, Which is what that guy found later in the nightstand. That makes sense. Okay, got it, got it, got it. So he tries, oh, this, excuse me, this answers your question, Em. He tries a different process of freezing the skeleton and the skull in an effort to preserve it. Wouldn't that make it more brittle? That sounds so stupid. It does not work. Okay. And the skeleton is dissolved in acid after the skull explodes in the oven after a failed attempt to dry it out. Okay. Well. So this is like the world's worst science experiment gone so wrong. Imagine just shattered so skull fragments in your oven and there's no in one. In your oven. <sighs> Where you, like, eat things. But, I mean, I guess here we go with Jeffrey Dahmer. It's not a concern to him, I guess. Ugh. <clears throat> so Dahmer later expresses regret at the waist uh, because he didn't get to keep any of it. Okay. Yikes. Well, let's just let that sink in. In early September of 1990, he runs out of drugs. So that's unfortunate. So he kills 22-year-old Ernest Miller by instead... Slicing his carotid artery. Ooh. Uh, yeah. That's one way to go. Yeah. 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 That's, so, one, that's one on the list that I hope doesn't happen to me. Because I... Yeah. Yeah. You know, when you think of, like, what's some of the worst ways to die? That's one of them. I had such a fear. I've, like, that word. I can't even think of that word. This, you know this whole thing like, is you know what's terrible? Word. I literally, like, sitting on my own couch, I think about this literally all the time. Like, I'm a crazy person. I, like, if I do this, like, just, like, yes. lean backwards, I'm, like... 
a random person behind me is going to slice my throat. I think about that too. Or like, I hate stretching like this because I'm, a, I am convinced the whole time, like my wrist is exposed and someone's going to like grab my wrist <laughs> or like cut my wrist. Like I get like any part where like, if it gets cut, I'm for sure bleeding out. I'm always so nervous about like even just stretching or sitting on my own fucking couch. Oh my God. I'm so, for paranoid. The murder. I'm so paranoid about it. I know I've had to stop watching Criminal Minds because like I will literally be just be, I mean, you know how I do this like when I'm nervous is hold my neck. I get like really weirdly protective of my Well of when oh. I when I'm like my comfiest is when I'm like sitting on the couch for all the lucky viewers. When I'm sitting on my couch at home, <laughs> I sit like this. Like or yeah. like I sleep like this too. Like I have like my arms up like I'm stretching. And the whole time, like I sleep like that too. Well, a lot With of times when I'm, when I'm on the couch, because we don't have a couch up against a wall, we just have it like an, an oh, open sure. back. So a lot of the times, like I'll just have my arms hanging over the couch. And then I'm like, I can't even see who's next to my wrists right now. Like I get <laughs> so paranoid. It <laughs> freaks me out. I'm sorry. This is not about me. Oh, wait, it is. It's my podcast. Okay. Uh <laughs> oh wait. It, everything is actually it's your world. Everything Everything's is about, about us. You. No. Um, sorry, moving on. The one of the worst ways to die got it yes uh it's all bad it's all bad but uh Ooh. he is literally brings his 22 year old home and then realizes he has no drugs and is like well guess i'll just slice his carotid artery <gasps> okay um i know it's just hell uh <sighs> he photographs the dissection and keeps the entire skeleton and parts of Ernest's biceps and legs Goodbye. and heart because he wants to eat them why would you want to eat that specifically so he thought that if he ate certain parts of these victims that uh, he would get some sort of power or attribute from the victim. Oh, so we're really getting like kind of fucking crazy now. Like, yes. Like if like I, he thought he could like absorb their life power or something. I mean, let's be If I could eat biceps and then have biceps, I would have eaten <laughs> RJ by now. Like it's like, yeah, RJ. it's <laughs> obvious. You're going to eat RJ. If I, I want those. <laughs> I just want that extra app. Just one. I'll just, just we'll give just, me one app. We'll just take them off one by one and we'll just go. <laughs> num, 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 num. And then all of a sudden we're Olympic swimmers. And then we're right. Then we're athletes. Athletes. Got um, it. So he's like really losing it now. It's not just like, I want to kill. It's like, I believe well, I can transform well also part of it which i thought was even more telling is that he thought he really had like i don't know if guilt is the right word but he like really had a concern that he was ending these people's lives and he would consider it he called it a waste when these people would die interesting he's like, he was like i need to do it but it's still a waste to end this person's life so he thought and he explained later that eating them maybe would keep them alive in some way like he would keep them alive because even I though their see. bodies were dead so, so that well, one was that's interesting because in me. that um episode of my strange addiction the wife who lost her husband and his and like had him cremated she at, at one point was like moving and like her the urn fell on the ground and some of his ashes fell out and so he she was like i don't want to vacuum up my husband and so she literally ate the ashes because she <laughs> was like i don't know like I don't know what the best thing to do is, but I'm not going to throw him away, but I also can't put him back. And I don't know why he should, go. I think the urn shattered or something. Right. So right. Like, like it and she didn't feels have a, less, she didn't have a cup near her or something. So she just ate it. And then like her strange addiction became literally eating her husband. Like apparently it, it like tasted good or she felt like there was a connection there. And so she like, right. and then eventually the, like at the end of the episode, they're like, what happens when you eat all of him? Like you don't get more ashes. Of I was your wondering that too. But so that would, I kind of get it from, I mean, they're two very different, th two very, very different sides, but they're kind of, they make sense in that like you want to kind of honor Yeah, you want to like it. absorb the other person. Like you want to absorb the other person and keep them with you in a weird way, which we've seen with other mm. murderers too. Like they eat their victim as a way of like becoming part of them like i mean it's just a or like trying to think of like the best way to to not i got i under there's no word for it but i understand what you're talking about yeah yeah and so there were, i mean it seems like there were a couple reasons um why he did this and obviously the other one is that he thought oh i can uh, get some life force out of these people excellent um so, <laughs> excellent indeed um he he also, I'm just going to put this one out there. I'm, I don't even know how else to prepare you, but he compared the texture of the biceps to that of a filet mignon. Um, 
So that's cool. I don't think it tasted like it, but he said the texture was like it. Yeah. It's just horrific. Uh, can you imagine being that person's like mother or, or sibling or friend or whatever? And you're like listening to this guy casually talk about how. Well, you know who I think, well, first of all, we all know my ass is going to eat filet mignon within the next seven days. And now I'm all going to think about his biceps, but (laughs) sorry. Uh, what, what was I going to say? Oh, it reminds me. I don't remember what the episode was anymore, but there was one. I, I've never been able to look at corn the same way because you said something. You said there was a oh, killer geez. who was like eating. He like had a girlfriend and like killed her and like literally was eating her. And like when he got to her like booty cheeks. Oh, my God. Apparently, because there's like a lot of fat in the butt, there was like he like oh described God. as like chunks of corn and in the meat i've never been able to look at corn again and so like but so that's what i'm thinking of holy crap i do you remember that i I can't forget i said that you sure did i don't make that up i like oh god that's horrific anyway in case you're wondering what the consistency of butt meat is apparently i wasn't you told me you're the one who told me i there i gotta figure out it was a story where he wanted to he would he wanted to practice cannibalism, but then there was a girl that he was interested in who like either rejected him and they stayed friends. Oh my god, yes. Um the uh exchange student. Yes. Oh my gosh. Is uh That's the story I'm thinking of. What is his name? It starts with an I. Yeah, I'll find I it. I don't want to know it. I don't know. I don't want to know either. Um, that's the story yikes. I'm thinking of where I've, I've never been able to look at corn the same. Or because you said there, I don't know why corn. Maybe you didn't that say that was... word, but that's how I envisioned it when you were describing okay, it. Okay, you literally just told me that I said that word. So now you're saying I didn't and I feel a lot better already. We'll have to listen to back eventually. I'm pretty <laughs> I'm sure you said corn. It. Okay, let's please, please quickly move forward. Uh, this is horrific. Um, I really, I'm very good at putting things into compartments of my brain that I will never look at again. And you've just like <sighs> unlocked it for me and dumped it all over my lap. You're so welcome. thank you for that. You're welcome. Um, let's see. September 24th, 1990, Dahmer murders 22 year old David Thomas. Um, he drugs him and strangles him, but he does not engage in sexual acts with him or with his body. He does photograph the dismemberment, but he says he retains no trophy of him because he didn't find him attractive. Okay, but you you (sighs) ate his biceps. You clearly kind of wanted his biceps. No, no, that was the next guy. Oh, I see. Okay, He ate the biceps of the guy that he found very attractive. This guy, Uh we're already on to the next victim, David Thomas. He uh, murdered him. He drugged and strangled him um, and photographed dismembering him, but didn't eat him or keep a trophy because he wasn't attracted to him. Okay, sorry. I'm sorry. He didn't. Too many fucking bodies. There's there's a lot of activities and a lot of bodies. He didn't engage in sexual acts with the body is what I meant. Got it. Um, He continues to maintain his regular appointments with his probation officer, so they don't know anything is wrong. Um, And neighbors in the apartment building begin to complain about a smell coming from Dahmer's apartment. And they, I can't even imagine if you're slicing carotid arteries in there, what that place probably smells like and you're cooking skulls and eating biceps. I mean, I can't, I cannot even begin to imagine. So they, they literally interviewed the neighbor in this, in this documentary. Um, and the, the, the guy is like, yeah, my wife had to call and be like, what is up with this guy's apartment? It smells so bad. And apparently he told them his freezer broke and all the meat rotted and some of my tropical fish died and they are rotting too. And everyone believed him because like. I'm sure it smelled like rotten meat, you know? Exactly. Like, why wouldn't you if this guy's like, shit, I'm so sorry, my freezer, you know, whatever. Like it's, you wouldn't immediately go, I bet he's cooking a skull in there. My ass would. I like after. We would. You and I would. After this (laughs) podcast, I smell meat fresh or not fresh. And I'm like, there's a dead body. I'm like convinced. We can't even eat corn apparently anymore. So we cannot. (laughs) We're screwed. Um, on each occasion where he's like confronted about this, he promises he'll fix the smell and neighbors are like, well, he was really quiet and friendly and polite. So they just kind of assumed it was fine. Okay. Um, by this point, however, he decides he is going to build an altar with all of the skulls and skeletons he's collected. Why not? Why not at this point? Why he's not? tried literally everything else with these body parts. That's true. <clears throat> so from October, 1989 to February of 1991, um, he 
tries and fails to lure anyone back to his apartment. So he's like lost his edge. Uh huh. I don't know if they can like sense the altar behind the door or what, but like they don't go back to his place. Uh huh. They're um, like, no, there's something different about you. Your your aura is yeah. off. You ate a bicep or two too many, and <laughs> something's wrong. Uh, yeah, your aura is really whack. I guess. Whack. Um, yeah. <laughs> So he's unable to lure anyone. I guess he changes up his routine because February 18th of 91, he lures 17 year old Chris Strotter back to his apartment with the promise of nude. I'm sorry, with promise of money for nude photographs. They have sex and then Dahmer drug strangles and photographs the dismemberment. He keeps the hands, head and genitals probably for his altar. Um, April of 91, so literally two months later, he brings 19-year-old Errol Lindsay back to his apartment where he drugs him. Now, this is when he decides he wants to make zombies. Um, and he wants to make zombies for his own, like, sex zombies, basically, okay. like we talked about earlier. Yes. So he decides the way to make zombies is to drill a hole into the victim's skull while they're alive, BTW. So this is some Madame Lowry dr- shit. Yes, it it's exactly like it's the same. I mean, it's not exactly, but that this actual procedure is one of the ones she did. I think. Yeah, the he, brain stirring. Oh. <laughs> wow, this is not a good episode. I think you and I. No, it's a really bad episode. <laughs> you and I. <laughs> you, you did the uncomfortable laugh twice, which I I only get to hear like at least. Oh, like at minimum, I'm sorry, at maximum, like once every two weeks. And I've heard it twice in two hours. Uh-huh. Things are not good for us. Mm-hmm. Um, so he he doesn't do brain stirring, um, which was a word I really hoped we'd never have to get into again. But here we are. Um, instead, he drills a hole into Errol's skull while he's, while he's unconscious. And he pours hydrochloric acid into it. Goodbye. Oh, uh, it doesn't work. I know that shocks you probably. Um but it doesn't work. Uh, he instead strangles him when he realizes his zombie idea isn't going to happen. He decapitates him and r- disposes of his remains. And before he does get rid of the remains, he tries to leather the skin. Um, but it, I mean, he's literally picking from picking and choosing from like every other serial killer. Like there's like Ed Gein in here. There's yeah. like, uh, there's like, Ed, uh, what's his name? Uh, John Wayne Gacy. There's like, pieces from all these different murder like madame Lalaurie, like i i don't know he just can't decide he can't pick a lane i guess he just picked the whole highway <laughs> he just like drove the wrong way down the highway <laughs> yeah um so his his leathered skin becomes too brittle so again he gets rid of it um, in May of 20, I'm sorry, May 24th of 91, he uh, murders a deaf man who's 31 years old named Tony Hughes. He leaves his body wrapped in a sheet in his bedroom. Uh, and it, guess what, by the way, uh, just a fun fact, this whole time he's still working at the chocolate factory. Shut the fuck up. Um, who the hell hired him? Who was that? Who was like, had so little staff where they were like, this guy can stay. I mean, I guess they don't know too much beyond his arrest, but like, shouldn't you have wondered how that went down or like checked in on him or tried to learn a little more about him, (laughs) you know, like get a beer after work and ask about his trophy box right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. or like open his locker every once in a while. I feel like if I feel like I would at least look in his locker and be like, is there any evidence here that proves that that arrest, you know? Right? Like, there's got to be, this guy's off, I guess. Mm. Um, But I guess maybe he wasn't that off because nobody else seemed to notice anything was wrong. So maybe he was just a a master manipulator. Yes. So uh, anyway, after he murdered Tony Hughes, he's still working at the chocolate factory, but his performance begins to falter. Um, Three days later, May of 1991, Dahmer lures a 14-year-old Laotian boy uh, named Konarak, since that's some phone, um, back to his apartment and get this by pure coincidence Konarak was the younger brother of one of the victims that Dahmer molested in 1988 like just by pure coincidence they just happened to be related and he happened to stumble upon them in Milwaukee like uh years apart that's awful I my heart really goes out to that family synthasm phone sorry I just remembered how to say it yeah it's horrific like both sons were victims um and the 
the brother was uh was quote unquote released like he uh he ended up surviving the a- attack however unfortunately his younger brother um becomes a victim of Dahmer's uh, in the worst way so he drugs and molests the boy um again he's 14 he then drills a single hole through his skull and injects hydrochloric acid into his frontal lobe uh when the boy loses full consciousness which i guess he hadn't done yet uh, he leaves the house to get more alcohol for himself then Konarak regains consciousness and stumbles naked out of the house along North 25th Street. This is when things get so infuriating, you just want to punch a hole in the wall. So two local 17-year-old girls, uh, one of whom was interviewed in this documentary and kind of retells this experience, see this boy, this young child, stumbling around. They call the police uh, in an effort to help him. But either to the drugging, either due to the drugging, brain injury, or both, he couldn't like say much more than basic Laotian. So like he knew English perfectly well, but like I guess someone had drilled into his frontal lobe. Okay, so I don't blame him for not having full capacity of language at that point. Um, so he's really struggling. Like they can't understand him. Um, so Dahmer returns home and sees the the two girls with Konarak. So they're two 17 year old girls and he tries to take Konarak back to the apartment, but the girls are like, no, the police are coming. You can't take him away. We're, we're calling the police. So two police officers named John Balzarak and Joseph Gabrish arrive at the scene only, uh, and they, they show up and they talk to Dahmer and he is a, obviously 30 year old white dude. These two girls are black and basically they tell them to butt out. It's none of their business and basically don't allow them to be part of the conversation, even though they're the ones who called the police and saw what was going on before the police wow. arrived. Um, Dahmer tells the police like, listen, it's just a misunderstanding. This is my 19 year old boyfriend. He had a bit too much to drink. Um, I have pictures at my apartment to prove it. If you want to see them, we're, we're together. Um, and the officers totally ignored the two girls who kept saying like, this is a child. That is not a 19 year old. That is a child and something is wrong. So they escort Dahmer and Konarak back to apartment 213. Oh my God. Um, and they, if they had checked, they would have, uh, seen pretty quickly that Dahmer is a registered sex offender, but they don't even run a basic check on his name. Why they would just, you? Like, why let, the fuck would why, you? Why though? Like, why would it even matter? So they let him go home, uh, so Konrak is this close to uh, being saved. And then he dies. <sighs> yeah. So Dahmer does show them uh, a folded pile of his clothes, of Konrak's clothes, and some Polaroids that he had, like, just taken of him. And I guess that was enough to prove that they were together. Um, and by the way, Tony's body, the one of his victims, is still in his bedroom wrapped in a sheet at this point. So, like... He literally is so cool as a cucumber that he lets them in the apartment and with a dead body in the other room and is like, no, no, this is just our place. Like, everything's fine. Don't even worry about the head <sighs> in the fridge. Okay. So, <sighs> Konrak is back inside with Dahmer, who injects more acid into his skull, and this time it kills him. The I remember, I do remember this, when they were doing the interview, the, the woman who was a a 17 year old girl at the time who had called the police said she went in and told her grandma what was going on and was like, you need to like help me figure out what to do here. And she goes back out and everybody's gone. The police are gone. Nobody took a statement or anything. So the, the, her grandmother, uh, calls the police to be like, Hey, we just want to check up on what happened to that boy you guys found. And they were like, no, ma'am, that wasn't, uh, they have the full taped call. They were like, no, ma'am, that wasn't, uh, a young boy that was the man's boyfriend he's an adult and she's like are you sure because like my granddaughter swears it was a child and he's like no ma'am um it was it was a full-grown adult they're together there were photos of them together in the apartment um and that's so fucked they up. make it yeah they make it very clear this is just a boyfriend boyfriend thing a boyfriend boyfriend spat and they want nothing to do with it so yikes um May 28th of 91, Dahmer calls in sick to work at the chocolate factory because he decides he wants to spend the day dismembering Tony and Konarak, um, who are now both dead in his apartment, and obviously keep the skulls. 
the following month, which is June of 1991. Happy birthday, Christine. <laughs> well, welcome to the world. <laughs> oh, my God. Um, okay. Yikes. Uh, Dahmer meets 20-year-old Matt Turner at the Gay Pride Parade in Chicago and convinces him to come to Milwaukee to, ha- to stay with him for a little bit. Turner is drugged, strangled, and dismembered, but Dahmer places his head and internal organs in plastic bags and stores them in the freezer. July 5th of 91, so a couple days later, uh, Dahmer brings 23-year-old Jeremiah Weinberger back to his apartment from Chicago as well with the intention of spending the weekend together. He drugs him, drills a hole into his skull, uh, injects boiling water into (gasps) it this time. That's like no better or worse than the other things, but it's just new information. It's just like a whole brand new horrific thing that we've just uncovered. I keep thinking um, there's not going to be any more bad information. I don't know it's what's true. wrong true. Like, I'm nearing the end of my notes and it's still just getting worse, like somehow. I don't know how. Jeez. Jeremiah uh, remains in a coma for two days before dying and being dismembered by Dahmer, who keeps his skull. July 12th of 91, Dahmer buys a 57-gallon drum uh for muriatic acid that he will dissolve the body parts and torsos in. Uh, Three days later, he meets 24-year-old Oliver Lacey on a street corner near his apartment. He lures uh, him back with promises of money for photographs um, that where he drugs him. He takes the following day off from work, but then I I guess taking the time off from work is enough, and they're like, you're suspended from your job. So I guess finally he crossed the line at work. Great. Not showing up. Yeah. He strangles Oliver. He uh, has sex with the corpse. Uh, He then dismembers him. He keeps the head and heart in the refrigerator and his skeleton in the freezer. And I guess I shouldn't say he has sex with the corpse. Like he sexually assaults, he rapes this person. Um, It is not consensual, obviously, by any means. Um, He keeps the head and heart in the refrigerator. He keeps the skeleton in the freezer. July of 1991, Dahmer is finally fired from the Ambrosia Chocolate Factory for poor performance. I know. It took a while. Holy crap. Can you imagine if that was your favorite chocolate bar and now you're like, Can you imagine if you were the boss? Like, you must look like such an asshole after all of this. You've gotta. You've gotta. Like, there's no way. Anyway. Um, The same day, Dahmer brings 25-year-old Joseph Braidhoff to apartment 213 where he drugs and strangles him. He leaves a body in the bedroom. This is grody. Uh, he leaves the body in the bedroom until it's infested with maggots. Um, he then decapitates and cleans the head, then dismembers the corpse, placing the torso in the acid drum along with two others. On July 22nd, Tracy Edwards agrees to go to Dahmer's apartment and drink. And this is bringing us back full circle. Tracy Edwards is a person we brought up in the prelude um, who uh, was handcuffed, threatened right. with a knife. right escaped flagged on police was brought back to the apartment which now is seeming like a really similar or familiar Maybe they were the story same cops at this point i mean really um so the worst part is there weren't the same cops there were four different oh. ones who kind of did the same sort of thing um obviously the first one was much worse because a it was a child and b it ended much more poorly but um after Jeffrey Dahmer's arrest, uh, the chief medical examiner says of the crime scene, quote, it was more like dismantling someone's museum than an actual crime scene. So I have a list here of some things they found in his apartment. Here we go. Okay. A human head and three bags of organs, which included two hearts, were found in the refrigerator. Three heads, a torso, and various internal organs were inside a freestanding freezer. Chemicals, formaldehyde, ether, and chloroform, plus two skulls, two hands, and male genitalia were found in the closet. A filing cabinet that contained three painted skulls, a skeleton, a dried scalp, uh, male genitalia, and various photographs of the victims, a box with two skulls inside, a 57-gallon vat filled with acid and three torsos, uh, victims' identification cards, bleach used to bleach the bones and the skulls, Incense sticks uh, in an attempt to cover the smells when the neighbors complained. They, they found a, a claw hammer, a handsaw, and three, or sorry, two drills um, along with separate drill bits, a hypodermic needle, various videos, some pornographic, and I guess some not pornographic. I don't know what the other videos like. Jeez. <laughs> like uh, the other one's American like- Tale. <laughs> like Balto. I don't know Balto. what the other. 
<laughs> what the other tapes were. Oh no! But some of them were pornographic. Some weren't. Um, that seems probably like the least problematic part of this whole list. Right. Um, a blood-soaked mattress and blood splatter, but blood spatter throughout the apartment, as well as a King James Bible. I was gonna say there's got to be a Bible in there somewhere. Something. Something. He yep. was trying to be a good Christian man. Remember? Oh yeah. So, beginning on July 23rd and over the course of 60 hours, Dahmer admits to his crimes and describes everything in great detail for detectives. Uh, It's revealed that most of Dahmer's victims were the most vulnerable of society, so runaways, sex workers, convicted criminals, gay youth who had been cast out by their families, some of whom, like I said, were never even reported missing. Um, Many were black or of mixed race, which fueled speculation that he was racist when he was picking his victims. Mm. However, psychiatrists disagree on this. Um, Some believe uh, that he was, but a lot of people, a lot of psychiatrists who have studied this blame uh, victim demographics because he generally hunted in close proximity to his apartment. Okay. And he lived in a predominantly black neighborhood. So they think maybe that's why his victims happen to be black. Okay. uh, So often, Um, Some psychiatrists point out that he killed people that he didn't want to leave him. And so he was just more attracted to those people. And those were the ones that he wanted to kill. I mean, none of it's good. Uh, And this is also disputed by one of the alleged rape rape victims and um, from his army days who uh, who said, no, that was nothing to do with it. Like he didn't just like, quote unquote, like black people better. That's not that doesn't explain his behavior. Um, It was also suggested at certain times, clearly nobody fully understands his motives, but uh, some suggested that Dahmer was self-hating and by killing gay men, he was attempting to kill the part of himself that he couldn't love. Mm. But most people dispute that generalization. I personally think that's a weak excuse and has troubling connotations uh, about somebody being gay and having, you know, it's just, mm, I don't, I don't really fly with that, but whatever. Um, Because Dahmer admitted his guilt, his trial, uh, which began on January 30th, 1992, ended uh, two weeks later. They had a big uh, debate about whether he was sane at the time of the crimes. Um, Psychiatrists for the prosecution and the defense agreed that he definitely had one or more mental mental illnesses, excuse me, um, but they differed on whether or not he understood the difference between right and wrong. Got it. Um, The witnesses are contentious with each other in and out of the courtroom. I mean, they're think about all the witnesses, like the number of victims and then the number of people I, who were involved. It's just like massive quantity oof. of people. Yeah. The jurors agreed that Dahmer was sane on 15 charges of murder with 10 jurors in agreement to dissenting. He was sentenced to life plus 10 years for the first two counts and life plus 70 for the each additional count for a total of 957 years. Holy shit. Yeah. And uh, Wisconsin abolished the death penalty in the mid-19th century. Very progressive. Um, So he was sentenced to life multiple times, um, but not death. He was, however, extradited to Ohio for the murder of Stephen Hicks, which was the first victim when he was 18. Right. And he he pled guilty to that uh, and got an additional full life sentence for that. At that point, he's like, like, what else is now? (laughs) Right. He's like, just bring the tape recorder. I have a lot more to say. Yeah. He talked and talked and talked. Like, it... I mean, I'm sure you've heard it, but like it's in all the documentaries, like his personal explanation of what he did and what he was feeling and why he did it. I mean, it's it's crazy. So fucked up. But it also gives such insight into like the mind of a serial killer. You know, yeah. I mean, he explains and admits to everything. Wow. So the apartment complex was raised and demolished. So that's probably good. Um, I can't imagine the energy in that place. Yeah, can you imagine He's, renting that place afterwards? No, you'd have to disclose that, I would think. Like, you'd have to. I couldn't even imagine, especially with, like, a laundry list of all those things they found. It's, like, every section of that room, it's, like, where do I put my couch? Like, where do I Like, literally, sleep where was, and know that, like... Where was there no blood or, yeah, like, an exploded skull? What patch of this room skull? doesn't have a dead body attached to it? Or, like, powdered skull in the oven. Oh. I mean, how do you even... Oh, yeah, how do you yikes. ever cook again? You couldn't. How do you put anything in that fridge? You buy a new fridge. fridge. Jesus. Oh, no. Um, So Dahmer spent the first year in prison in solitary confinement for his own protection. But then at his request, he was slowly integrated into the general prison population. Uh, He recorded hours of confessions for posterity to assist both forensic psychologists and law enforcement. 
And because Dahmer was average to slightly above average intelligence, uh, he was able to articulate like the variables and feelings that led him to kill so gruesomely and like the thought and feeling behind it. So that kind of led uh, to a better understanding of the mind of a serial killer. Um, According to Dahmer's father and his minister and friend, Roy Ratcliffe, Dahmer became a born again Christian in prison and was baptized in May of 94. However, in July of 94, he was attacked and slashed by a fellow inmate. Um, The wounds were superficial, but at this point, his dad said that his son uh, believes he deserves that whatever happens to him in prison is something that should happen to him. So I guess at this point, I mean, he did turn to the, the officer or the cop when they were when he was getting arrested and said like, I deserve to die for this. So clearly. Right. He knew what he was doing. He knew what he was getting into. Right. In November of 94, uh, Dahmer and two men named Jesse Anderson and Christopher Scarber were left alone on work detail in the showers. Um, When guards returned, they found 34 year old Jeffrey Dahmer beaten to death with a metal chair leg and sodomized with a broom handle. Jesse Anderson had also been beaten and clung to life for two days. Scarver, uh, who had killed them was diagnosed, but uh, sorry, had diagnosed, but untreated mental illness. And he says he killed them because God told him to, he spent many years in solitary. Um, but later he elaborated on his story saying Dahmer would taunt the prisoners and the guard by molding his food into the shapes of people and drizzling ketchup all over it, like blood before eating it. Um, and the day of the killing, Scarborough said Anderson and Dahmer were taunting him because they were white and he was black. And that's what wow. triggered the the attack. All right. Then. Um, in 96, Dahmer's estate was auctioned off. The proceeds would were going to be given to victims' families who sued the estate. However, there was a group called the Milwaukee Civic Pride who were disgusted by the fact that people were bidding on the pot that Dahmer boiled heads in. So they settled with the families for over 400000 for everything in the Dahmer auction. Then they destroyed everything, spread it out, and buried the pieces in various unnamed landfills so that Dahmer memorabilia couldn't be glorified, which I'm fully on board with. Yeah. I'm like, I don't think it's fun to collect like... Like, I get the interest, but I don't think it's, right. like, cute and it's kitschy to, like... It's taste. Yeah. No. And to have, like, especially the things that were... That killed these people or, like, held their dead bodies. It's just... Like, I get a letter from uh, John Wayne Gacy or a painting. That's... Okay, sure. But, like... Well, like, the actual the, item involved in, like, a victim's death. Yeah, yeah, it just feels so icky to me, especially if you're paying like enormous amounts of money for it like as to like what, a kitschy to show it item off, to be like, yeah, look what I exactly. Have. Like you're you're so eccentric with your decor; it's just wild to me. But I mean, I I know people disagree with this. I do have an issue with like glorifying serial killers, and like I, I just think it's important to tell the stories. I don't love you know decorating your house with their posters or whatever, but that some people like to do that. So I I like the idea of them being collected for the sake of museums, like the museum of death. Like if you want to go somewhere to be educated on it, sure. Right. But like to just have it and then like actually cook other Mm -hmm. food in it and then make some weird joke about like, Oh, heads have been cooked in here. You know, like that's like, yeah, that's like someone's mother is crying. Well, you know, right. It like so dismisses the whole pain and pain and horror of the whole thing. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm with you for sure on that. Um, Joyce, his mother, who we like haven't talked about at all since the beginning, um, had just reconnected with Jeffrey right before his arrest. And that must've been quite a reunion. Um, wow. but she died of cancer in 2000. David, the younger brother changed his last name and he lives in anonymity, which good for him. Sure. Um, I, I wonder if he changed his first name too, since Jeffrey Dahmer literally named him. Yikes. <clears throat> So officers Balzarak and Gabrish, who were the ones who handed Konrak back to Dahmer, were initially fired once his crimes were revealed, along with recordings of them making homophobic statements in relation to the incident. However, they appealed and got their jobs back. So of course. good for them. Of course. Why not? Konrak's family was awarded $850,000 from the city of Milwaukee after they sued for the city, sued the city for the officer's neglect. Um, and Balzarak became president of the Milwaukee Police Association, really, for several years. So, Excellent. fuck you. Excellent. Uh, many movies and books have obviously been written about Dahmer. Um, most notable is probably the graphic novel My Friend Dahmer, 
which was uh, written by John Durf, Back Durf, uh, about his friendship with Jeffrey Dahmer during their teenage years and then was adapted to a film in 2017. There are a couple on Netflix. One came out this year. They all seem to be pretty thorough just because there's so much information and Jeffrey himself gave so much, you know, firsthand information that they're right. like pretty thorough and clearly they're still making them. So um, that is a story The uh, there's... There's a lot. And that is it. Wow. Well, thank you for finally <laughs> telling the story, but also wow, what a what a doozy. Sorry it took me so long. Uh, no, I mean, I think when you say Jeffrey Dahmer, people just kind of buckled in. I think it's like, well, we know what's coming. Yeah. Yeah. I think uh if they even glance at the show notes and see probably like a two hour episode, they're gonna be like, Well, yeah, better drive in circles today. I better, I better um, clean the entire house three times. Yeah, uh, I wish I were. I wish I could listen to our own show. And people are always like, "You inspire me to vacuum." I was like, "I wish I could inspire myself to vacuum," <laughs> but it hasn't happened yet. Yeah, no. A lot of times, uh, Allison will listen to our show while we're like, like if we're cooking or something, and I'm like, "Can you turn me off?" It's please? so like, it's weird, like, right? I, it's like, I can't. I don't. I don't want to cook to my voice. Like I, no. I already don't shut up. I don't need two of me. You and I hear our, our own voices so consistently and constantly that, like, we don't need to be reminded of how much we talk <laughs> too, too much. Well, thank you guys for listening, and I hope your house is sparkling now and your car is <laughs> – the tires are rotated nicely. So um, I guess that's it, right? So I think that's it, man. I don't have AC, so I'm sweating. I'm going to go turn a fan on or something. Okay, well, I guess that's it then. So thank you for listening, and come back next week. Yeah, please come back. I promise we'll be exactly the same and nothing will change. Okay. And <laughs> that's why we a drink. <laughs> I guess. I'm literally drinking today, so I'm on board. All right. Bye. Bye. Bye.